mandate, and we're delighted to do it. Um, I'm going to let the other panelists, very distinguished panelists, introduce themselves. We want to get going because we've got a lot to talk about. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Jim. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Danny Chu. I'm currently a judge with the San Mateo Superior Court, and I was a member of the Rules Revision Commission that helped propose these rules. Hi, I'm Mary Baldwin. I'm at Rogers Joseph O'Donnell here in San Francisco. I'm a former chair of the California uh, State Bar Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct. I'm very honored to be included here. I was the chair during the period of time that we actually had to provide public comment on all the rules. So those of us who were on COBRAC at the time know what an exhausting procedure that was. It was great to be so enmeshed in the rules. And I got to sign all of COBRAC's public comment letters. So it looked like I was very busy that year. <laughs> Would you work? <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Bundy. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor uh, of law at UC Berkeley, and I practice law in the city with a little law firm called Taylor and Patchen. Uh, and uh, I am also a co prac person, um, mentored by uh, um, some of the people to my right, and uh, that's I think all I'll say. And I'm Amy Bomsey. I would like to say that at the beginning. Um, I'm the current chair of COPAC. Uh, I'm a partner at a law firm called Arnold and Porter. Um, and I practice uh, largely in the area of community um, And I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you. Okay, so I get to lead off. Um, all right, so um, the development of the rules was a fairly lengthy, I guess, a three-year process beginning at the end of 2014 when the second rules division commission was appointed. Uh, in order to guide the rules division commission in developing these new rules, the California Supreme Court provided what I would call a charter for the first to five months. And those, the charter was extremely helpful in guiding the commission in deciding how to draft the rules. And what the charter did was first it identified for sort of three overarching goals of the rule. One, and probably the most important, which is foremost in the Commission's mind, was protecting the public. The second was promoting confidence in the legal profession. And the third, which I'm sure most of you are most interested in, is trying to provide the clearest possible guidance to lawyers and those who enforce the rules. And just as helpfully, the court identified the process that that wanted the commission to use in developing these new rules. First, and this was very different from the original rules of issue commission that was established um, a while back, that they wanted us to begin with the existing California rules. So the starting point was always with the pre, well, I guess it's not required California rules, to start with those, and then decide what changes are necessary. And in determining what changes would be necessary, the commission was told to be guided by when it's necessary to address changes in the law, and secondly, when and if appropriate, to eliminate unnecessary differences between the model rules that are adopted in the vast majority of jurisdictions to try to bring California to greater conformity with the same rules that are applied in other jurisdictions, to the extent possible. Um, of course, California, as we all know, is unique in a lot of different ways. Um, the other thing that the um, California Supreme Court told the Commission was that any duties, obligations, and prohibitions to the extent possible should be in the black letter of the rule. So you wouldn't have to figure out what the actual duties, prohibitions, and obligations were by trying to read through comments. Um, the comments were intended to be used sparingly to merely clarify the rules. And, and finally, the, the court said, try to avoid aspirational statements. You know, don't try to suggest what lawyers should do, just tell them what they can and cannot do. So part of um, an issue that came up, uh, and this is a new aspect of California and how they regulate lawyers, is that California has a dual structure. Uh, most states have rules that guide lawyers' conduct. California has statutes and additional rules. And that, to a certain extent, limited what the commission can do to conform California to the rules that have adopted by other jurisdictions. So if the statutes can only be amended by the legislature, we were pretty much controlled by those statutes when they apply. And ultimately, 70 new rules or amended rules were proposed 
69 were approved by the California Supreme Court. 27 were basically approved as proposed. Uh, 42 were some minor modifications. A couple of rules were sent back to the commission to make minor modifications. The last one was rule 1.2.1, which was the last one that was adopted on September 28th. And one rule was rejected. The rule 1.14 on diminished capacity was rejected by the court with no explanation. So we don't know exactly why it was rejected, but that was the only one. And, and as Amy mentioned, the rules became effective yesterday. <laughs> So I'm going to begin um, a couple other minor things to keep in mind. Uh, there are a few global changes. Uh, the, the court adopted the model rule numbering, so it's easier to compare what the California rule is to other rules in other jurisdictions. They try to match them up as closely as possible. Um, the term member was replaced by lawyer. This was account for the fact that um, a lot of People who are not necessarily members of the state bar are covered by rules, you know, law students, people going pro hoc vice, so it was a broader terminology. There's also a definition section in Rule 1.01, and any term that was defined is asterisk throughout the rule. So if you see an asterisk beside a term, it's actually defined in Rule 1.01 for easy reference. So, Beginning with rules 1.1 and 1.3, uh, these are the rules governing competence and diligence. Uh, the prior California rule defined competence and included diligence as a subcategory of competence, but to conform more with how the national rules or the model rules are done and what most jurisdictions do, um, the new rules divide competence and diligence into two separate rules. 1.1 addresses competence and 1.3 addresses diligence. Both of these requirements are unwaivable. Uh, the one thing... for that matter to a competent attorney. Um, seems kind of self-evident, but it, it was thought that that would be helpful to make it clear. Uh, the other thing is that there was an emergency exception that was included in situations which probably don't arise that much where a client needs immediate legal advice and the options aren't really feasible, that you're authorized to do the, to the extent of what is reasonably necessary to help that client in order to address the emergency situation. <coughs> Now, with respect to diligence, um, there was a little bit more clarification in terms of what diligence means. Uh, the prior rule just simply included diligence within the term competence. By moving it into a separate rule, the separate rule first makes clear that it's only reasonable diligence that is required, and also defines diligence. And it's important to note that the definition of diligence includes the duty of loyalty to the client. Um, and that was in order to make clear that only neglect, disregard, or undue delay that conflicts with the duty of loyalty would result in discipline under Rule 1.3. So Rule 1.2 covers the scope of representation and allocation of authority. There is no counterpart to this rule in the previous model, previous rules of professional responsibility, but this was adopted first to partially conform with the model rules where I believe just about every other jurisdiction has a 1.2. Um, it's also to clarify the relationship between the lawyer and the client and also contribute to access to justice, particularly the provisions dealing with limited scope representation. Um, Although the rule has no counterpart, the 
the substance of the rule really conforms to the policies already reflected in California case law, statute, rules of court, and the previous rules. Um, in terms of the substance of the rule, the rule makes clear that the lawyer must reasonably consult with the client about the means to achieve the client's objectives. The client has absolute authority over substantive decisions. Those include you know, the objective of the representation, the means, settlement, pleas, and waivers of rights. But the lawyer has implied authority over procedural matters and strategy. Uh, important thing to note is that 1.2b makes it clear that limited scope representation is okay. Uh, this was deemed to be an important access to justice issue to allow more people to retain lawyers when they need them on a limited basis. Um, also, the comments here are extremely helpful. Comment two notes that advanced authorization is appropriate, uh, which is very important, for example, in settlement negotiations or mediations. Comment three makes it very clear that just because you represent a client does not mean that you endorse that client's actions or their viewpoints. It was felt that that was an important thing to make clear in the rules. Um, and then 1.2.1 was what was previously model rule 1.2D, and that was moved into a separate rule because of the way the California law works. So rule 1.2.1 addresses advising or assisting the violation of law. This rule basically carries forward the substance of prior rule 3-210, but it adds additional clarifying language that was derived from model rule 1.2D. And the rule is also then divided into two subdivisions. Subdivision A basically tells you what is prohibited, and subdivision B then tells you what is permitted. So what were the changes? Most of them are fairly minor. First, in addition to prohibiting advice about violations of law, it prohibits assistance. That seems kind of self-evident, but it was thought that that would be helpful to make it clear. Uh, it also clarifies that any act that what's prohibited is any advice or assistance for any act that is criminal or fraudulent in addition to being a violation of a law, rule, or ruling of a tribunal uh, in order to emphasize that aspect. Uh, the other thing that the rule does is make clear that the lawyer actually has to know that the act is criminal, fraudulent, or violates law, rule, or ruling of a tribunal. That is an actual knowledge standard, but it does, but as the law makes clear, and as the definition of knowledge makes clear, you can infer knowledge from these circumstances. Um, it also clarifies the exceptions for when it's okay to advise or address issues where the client's actions may be criminal, fraudulent, or violating a law. Um, it indicates that the lawyer can discuss the legal consequences of that act, which is a very fine but important distinction. And it also permits what was stated in the rule before, which is a good faith effort to determine the validity, scope, meaning, or application of the law, ruling, rule, or ruling. So this is another rule where the comments, I think, are very helpful. Comment one, and this is really the fine distinction, is it distinguishes between an analysis of the act versus recommending it. And that's a very important distinction. It is perfectly fine and probably part of your duty to advise a client who is considering a criminal or fraudulent or an illegal act to understand what the legal consequences are and perhaps to understand why it may be criminal or fraudulent. But you can't recommend to that client that they do that action. <clears throat> Comment four talks about civil disobedience and again stresses that it is perfectly fine and in fact appropriate to advise about the legal consequences of breaking a law in order to protest something as a form of civil disobedience. And in comment six was a paragraph that actually the California Supreme Court sent the rule back to the commission to revise. And I like to call this the marijuana comment. <laughs> um, and most of the public comment about this issue really surrounded you know, the issues with, with marijuana where it obviously conflicts potentially with federal law. Uh, and in revising this comment, what it makes clear is that it is entirely appropriate for a lawyer to assist in drafting or administering or interpreting or complying with California law, even if that law conflicts with federal or tribal law. But the important thing to keep in mind <coughs> is that the lawyer has a duty to inform the client about that potential conflict and other rules 
may create an obligation on the part of that lawyer to advise about that conflict. So the next rule I have is rule 1.4. This rule addresses communication with clients. And this rule significantly expands upon pre prior, <clears throat> prior rule 3-500, which simply addressed two duties uh, by the lawyer. One was to promptly inform clients of significant developments, and the other was to promptly comply with reasonable requests for information and documents. The portion of rule 3 Rule 3-500 is currently found in Rule 1.4, Subdivision A3. But Rule 1.4 adds additional obligations to the lawyer in communicating with his or her client. One, they have to promptly inform of anything that requires informed consent. They have to reasonably consult on the means to accomplish the client's objectives. And they have to advise on limitations of the lawyer's conduct due to rules or other laws. Uh, another subdivision then explains what the required scope of those communications include, and it's pretty common sense. You, you need to basically communicate to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions. So you've got to give enough information to the client so the client can make an informed decision about what to do next. Uh, there are limited exceptions. Two were acknowledged in the um, rule. One is you can delay disclosure if it would lead to imminent harm to clients or others. And the other is if it's uh, prohibited by a protective order, NDAs, or law. And comment three, I think, will be something that is appreciated for the modern lawyer, that electronic copies are OK when the client is requesting information. <clears throat> the last rule I have is rule 1.6. And frankly, this is a rule I'm not going to spend much time talking about because it is largely identical to Rule 3-100. And the reason it's largely identical to Rule 3-100 is this is an example where the rule is dictated by a California statute, Business and Professions Code 6068E, which basically imposes a higher duty of confidentiality on California lawyers than I would say just about every lawyer in every other jurisdiction in this country. Uh, the rule was numbered to conform to the model rule 1.6, which is the rule that addresses similar issues, but it is very different from 1.6 because of Business and Professions Code 6068E. And that's a recognition that the duty of confidentiality is broader than the attorney-client privilege. It includes info that, by, that the lawyer acquires by virtue of the representation regardless of the source, and it encompasses information protected by the attorney-client privilege, but also the work product privilege and ethical rules. There is one exception under the California statute, and that is for life-threatening criminal acts. It's a pretty limited exception that, uh, frankly, I don't think applies very often. Uh, that's in significant contrast to Model Rule 1.6, um, the national rule, which identifies, I would say, seven other exceptions, none of which were added to 1.6 because this is dictated by statute. The rule also clarifies, <clears throat> again, based on the prior rule, that before really revealing any confidential information, even for a life-threatening act, that the lawyer has to make an attempt to persuade the client not to commit the life-threatening act, uh, but also that you have to inform the client of your ability or intention to disclose it. And with that, I will hand it off to Great. Uh, so from confidential information, we're going to jump to 1.8.2, which is use of current client's information. And this is part of the 1.8 series. Um, which uh, in the model rules, 1.8 is part of the conflicts rules, and it's a, a, large, a large rule with a lot of different subparts. In California, the, the Rules Provision Commission and the Supreme Court chose to break out 1.8 into separate rules. So, so 1.8.2 is its own separate rule. And this rule simply provides, and it doesn't have a counterpart in our prior rules, that uh, it violates the duty of loyalty for lawyers to use confidential, their current client's confidential information to the disadvantage of the client. Now, that's certainly something I think that most of us understood, but now there's an express prohibition which 
you know, frankly, that the more expressed these rules can be, it's always to the advantage of both lawyers and the public as far as I'm concerned. So the, the, the rule is directed exclusively to lawyers using their current client's confidential information to the disadvantage of that client. So lawyers can use a current client's confidential information in ways that don't disadvantage that current client, for example. So it's important to understand you know, what that means. Disadvantage is not one of the asterisks defined terms. That is the language that's used in Model Rule 1.8 so we do have uh, guidance from other jurisdictions about what that might mean. Um, the, the Rules Revision uh, Commission did not adopt the comment to Model Rule 1.8, which clarifies and gives some examples of what disadvantage uh, use to the disadvantage of a client might be. Even though it's not in the rule, it, it's at least that could provide at least some guidance to lawyers trying to figure this out. Um, I would note that this rule, uh, by its title, addresses the use of current client's confidential information. The use of a former client's confidential information is set forth in 1.9, and I think Steve will, will talk about that. Um, ah, everyone's favorite rule. Uh, sexual relations with current clients, 1.8.10. Again, one of the 1.8 series broken out into a separate rule. Those of you who follow the Rules Revision Commission got uh, extremely tired of articles and commentary addressing this rule. People were going nuts. The general rule, it's very simple, you basically can't have sexual relations with a current client unless you're married to them or the sexual relationship existed in a consensual way prior to the attorney-client relationship starting. Not incredibly radical, not incredibly nuanced. I can't imagine it's really going to result in that many lawyers changing their practices. Uh, you know, really does this happen that much? You would imagine from the a level of commentary and excitement that it does, but you know, whatever. So it's a nice, simple rule. Um, there, there is a, an important uh, section of the rule which talks about third party complaints uh, about violations of this rule. And it, at, the, the, at the very end, it says that no notice of disciplinary charges may be filed where it's arising from a third party complaint unless the state bar has attempted to get the client's statement uh, or has and has considered whether the client would be unduly burdened by such a charge. So this will not provide a means for a third party to create some mischief by raising complaints about someone else's sexual relationship. Um, at least that's what the, uh, the rule is intended to do. I also will point out comment two, which addresses the situation where the client is an entity and what it, you know, you can't have sex with an entity. Um, but what it means, <laughs> uh, although I, you know, got, judging from the excitement about this rule, I, maybe people will be trying, I don't know. Um, but when the, when the client is an entity, the, the rule is addressed to basically the person within the entity who is the lawyer's main contact. Okay, now that we've uh, covered that exciting rule. Um, organization as client, rule 1.13. This, uh, this is an interesting rule. For those of us who are familiar with the model rules, this was something that you know, was of great interest to see how the Rules Revision Commission and the Supreme Court would choose to um, apply this. Um, the, the rule that's adopted is fairly consistent with the model rule and, frankly, fairly consistent with prior Rule 3-600 with a few important changes. Um, first, I think the new rule is more clear um, about what the requirements are, and that's helpful. Um, the, there is mandatory up-the-ladder reporting uh, when there's illegal activity by a constituent of the entity. But what's different about our Rule 1.13 and the model rules is that uh, the lawyer cannot, in, in making that up-the-ladder reporting, or otherwise cannot violate the duty of confidentiality. So Judge Chu's already talked about uh, 1.6 and how it interacts with uh, 6068E. Again, we're, we have that existing legislative limitation about what the duty of confidentiality is, and nothing, none of the rules, so this is an example of one of these rules that couldn't, that the Rules Commission couldn't change to conform to the model rule in terms of 
the uh, exception for duty confidentiality because we don't have that exception in California. So the, all of the actions, even the ones required under 1.13, the lawyer cannot violate the duty confidentiality. So what that means practically is no reporting out, uh, even if the highest authority in the corporation refuses to take action, uh, unlike the model rule where the lawyer could then make the report of the client's confidential information to somebody outside the organization that is not allowed in California. The most that the lawyer can do in that situation is resign or withdraw. And that's set forth in 1.13e. Um, it's, it, it's important to, to understand, for those of us who represent entities, it's important to um, spend some time on this rule because there are mandatory sections of this rule. Many of the rules that we talk about, uh, especially with around uh, confidentiality, you know, some type, for example, the exception that uh, Judge Chu talked about in uh, death or substantial bodily harm, the lawyer may disclose. In this, uh, in Model Rule 1.13, there are specific requirements that the lawyer has to take. For example, when someone in the entity is taking a legal action and the entity itself is not responding. So it's important to read that rule and understand it. Um, lastly, I'll point out 1.13G specifically recognizes that it's possible to provide joint representation to the organization and to a constituent of that organization, but you have to get the informed written consent of both, and the entity cannot consent through that individual who's being jointly represented. So that's a, a helpful qualification for lawyers who find themselves in that situation. Uh, now we'll move to fees and client property, and there are three <coughs> rules that I'm going to uh, discuss in that regard. First is Rule 1.5, Fees for Legal Services. This is former Rule 4-200. Uh, uh, California has retained the unconscionability standard uh, for fees. We didn't adopt the uh, unreasonable standard of the model rules. Uh, there's a, the set of factors which will determine whether a fee is unconscionable, is set forth in the rule. It's basically the same factors that were set forth in uh, Rule 4-200 with two additional um, factors. Um, and let me find that. The two additional factors are the first two in the rule. And those are, one, whether the lawyer engaged in fraud or overreaching in negotiating or setting the fee. And secondly, whether the lawyer has failed to disclose material facts. Um, and then we've got the, the same uh, 11 following, the relatively same uh, factors that were in the existing <coughs> rule. The rule specifies that uh, there can be no contingent fees in criminal and certain family law matters. That's consistent with uh, prior California rules. Um, it also, the, the rule also makes clear I think in a helpful way, that a true retainer is the only kind of non-refundable fee that is allowed. And it, for those of us who you know, work with lawyers and advise lawyers, this is often a source of confusion for lawyers about whether they can charge a non-refundable fee. And now, I think helpfully, this rule makes clear that you cannot unless it's a true retainer. And we all recall, a true retainer is defined in the rule, a true retainer is a fee that is paid solely to secure the lawyer's availability. It doesn't happen a lot, um, but if it, if it is appropriate in, in an instance, a lawyer may collect that, it will be non-refundable, but the client, under the rule, has to, be, uh, agree, has to agree in writing after disclosure that the client will not be entitled to a refund of all or part of that fee charged. So this is helpful in the you know, limited number of circumstances when true retainers uh, may be appropriate. The other um, important and helpful uh, aspect of this uh, Rule 1.5 is Section E, which provides that a lawyer may make an agreement for, charge, or collect a flat fee for legal services and defines uh, the flat fee as being a fee, a fixed amount that constitutes complete payment for a specified set of legal services. Um, and that fee can be paid in whole or in part in advance of the lawyer providing those services. So 
that raises a question about what the lawyer must do with a flat fee paid in advance, and we will see that when we get to Rule 1.15, which talks about trust accounts. Division of fees among lawyers uh, is Rule 1.5.1. This is uh, former Rule 2-200. This is an important rule for certain types of lawyers that uh, either co-counsel and share fees um, or potentially do make referral fees. There is no sharing fees among lawyers who are not in the same firm unless the lawyers enter into a written agreement and full disclosure is made to the client in writing. What's important about an important change in this rule as it compared to the prior rule is that now the client has to provide written consent, which was always the case, but the critical distinction now is when that informed consent from the client has to be obtained. It used to be before the monies were actually paid and divided among the lawyers. Now, under this rule, the client has to consent in writing at the time the lawyers enter into their written agreement to share fees or as soon thereafter as practicable. So that's a very important uh, requirement for lawyers to be aware of um, when they're uh, engaging in fee splitting. Um, then the last rule I'll cover is the safekeeping funds and property of clients and other persons. This is Rule 1.15, formerly Rule 4-100. And this governs uh, trust accounts in California and how lawyers are required to handle funds that belong, uh, that are received or held for the benefit of a client. I would also note, and I think this is an important development, this rule now also expressly applies to funds that are uh, held or received by the lawyer for the benefit not just of the client, but also for third persons. For example, funds that might be subject to a lien. Um, this, is, this provides much more guidance now that the same obligations that apply when a lawyer is holding funds for a client now also apply when that lawyer is, fund, is holding funds for the benefit of the third party. So uh, it provides that the, uh, that the trust account should be maintained in California or with written consent from the client in another jurisdiction where there's a substantial relationship between the representation and the client's business. Um, the, uh, the rule requires now that advanced fees, uh, as well as costs and expenses, be deposited into the client trust account. That represents a change from the prior rule. It used to be you didn't have to deposit advanced fees in a trust account. Now this applies to all advances. It also applies to an advanced flat fee. Um, there are certain limitations. If, if you are in the, in the habit of collecting advanced flat fees, you should look very carefully at the rule and understand whether your flat fee requires, um, uh, if it's going to be under $1,000, one set of rules applies. If it's over $1,000, uh, you have to obtain a different kind of uh, consent from the client. So make sure you understand that. Um, the, uh, there's no commingling of lawyer funds with trust funds. That's similar to existing rule, except funds to pay bank charges. Um, or funds that belong part to the client and part to the firm. Once the firm's interest is fixed, it must be withdrawn. And if it's disputed, that disputed portion must be left in the trust account until that dispute is resolved. And then lastly, there are a set of specific requirements in the rule that dictate what lawyers must do with respect to their client trust accounts. These are basically similar to the old rule, but there's some uh, distinctions. There's also a set of standards attached to uh, Rule 1.15, which also provides specific requirements um, for lawyers in handling client trust accounts. So uh, as, as many of us know, client trust accounts are often a source of discipline for lawyers. So it's, I think it's very important that lawyers become familiar with this new rule and understand how it applies. I'll pass the service, Steve. Okay. Um, well, I'm supposed to talk about uh, and which way, how, which, which is the thing that makes it get there. Well, there we go. Terrific. Um, so I'm supposed to talk about conflict of interest rules and imputation. I want to say um, this is maybe the si single biggest improvement 
in the uh, rules. And uh, why is that? Well, the old conflict rules uh, were uh, a little bit incoherent, and they were incomplete in that they really didn't describe accurately what the law was in important ways. Uh, and in particular, they didn't include a huge body of case law that informed uh, how lawyers actually practice. Um, and uh, what's happened is that the rules have become much more comprehensive in their coverage of the important issues. And uh, they've become much more reliable guides to the critical questions that lawyers have to decide. Uh, they're all in the room, and uh, there are, or many of them are, and there are comments that are also exceptionally helpful in helping to think about how the basic provisions of the rule work. The first big change you can see on this slide, right, which is that all of this material has been reorganized in a way that conforms to the model rules and that is extremely helpful. So you start with a sort of basic, generic conflict of interest rule and how that applies to individual lawyers, right? Then, uh, and we just have an example of it here, there are a set of specialized conflict rules, the 1.8 series. And I'm not going to talk about them in detail. Mary's talked about two of them already. I'll mention the one that's on the screen. Right? Then we get to the question of what is an individual lawyer's duty to former clients broken out. Right? And then in 1.10, we get to the question of what under what circumstances is an individual lawyer's conflict imputed to the firm, and firm means organization here, an organization of lawyers delivering legal services, uh, in, of which the uh, lawyer is a part, right? So it's very logical, and then at the end here, we have 1.18, the duty to, to prospective clients, which brings into the rules a really important body of law that spells out when you have effectively former client obligations uh, to, a, uh, to a prospective client. So that's the framework. Let me just talk now about uh, the, net, the, 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 big, uh, the big rule, right? This is the basic conflict of interest rule with respect to current clients. It says that without informed written consent, there are two kinds of conflicts that, uh, that a lawyer can have. One is direct adversity, right? In the same or an even in an unrelated matter, you may not proceed in a manner on behalf of one client that is directly adverse, right? Now you think that means suing, but it means a whole host of other things, and the comments to the rule helpfully bring out a variety. It could mean taking their deposition in an unrelated matter. It could mean <laughs> examining their intellectual property for a client uh, uh, yeah, to see how that property reads. The point is that that's the number one prohibition in 1.7a. Um, in 1.7, B, the second concept, and here we borrow from the ABA rules in a way that's exceptionally helpful and that actually, I think, brings up California, brings California law into conformity to case law as well, um, that you may not uh, represent a client without informed written consent where there is a significant risk that your representation will be materially limited by your obligations to another client, by your obligations uh, uh, or relationships to another client, a former client or third person, or by your own personal interests. All right. So that reorganizes and restates in a very clear way some basic principles and follows the ABA. I'll come back to informed written consent in a second. Um, second piece of the rule, which is unique to California, Right, is the requirement listed below here of written disclosure. Right? 
And what it says, and it's a little counterintuitive, but it preserves some features of California law that existed before, is that um, even if you don't have a significant risk that your representation will be impaired, you still have to make written disclosure to the client in two types of situations. Uh, and one is where there's a business professional personal legal relationship with a party or witness in the same matter, right? And the other is whether there, where there's a relationship with the other party's lawyer or another party's lawyer in the same matter, right? These provisions uh, trigger, right, whether or not they, they, they give rise to a conflict of interest. The theory is there's something that the client would like to know as a matter of full disclosure, right? And so it's a client protective measure that's been preserved. So we have those two pieces, the informed written consent for direct adversity or material uh, representation, uh, material risk of representation clients, and, uh, and then disclosure uh, for these uh, uh, relationship issues, right? The rule also defines matter uh, in a way that is exceptionally broad. So if the question is, are you in the same matter, right, which is important for a number of these different rules, right, uh, there's a very broad definition in Part B of the rule. The comments <coughs> are super interesting, and I'll come back to them in a second. But let's talk for a sec about informed written consent. Uh, California law used to have this very confusing mix of uh, situations where informed written consent was required, situations where disclosure was required, and there was a misleading implication in the rule that informed written consent was always enough to cure a conflict. That's been fixed, right? California now has, a, in the new rule, informed written consent is a defined term. Right under 1.01, you've got to make written disclosure right, of uh, the circumstances and the risks, including in particular the downside risks, right, in order to have the consent be valid. Even if you do that, there are now circumstances under the rule, and this is part D of the rule, where consent will not solve the problem, right? You can't solve the problem with consent if you objectively don't have a reasonable belief that you can represent both of the consenting clients effectively, right? And uh, you also can't solve the consent problem where it's prohibited by law. For example, uh, the Sixth Amendment in criminal cases might well make certain kinds of consents invalid. And finally, reflecting California case law, you can't appear on behalf of two adverse parties in the same litigation um, uh, in front of a uh, tribunal, right, where you are asserting a claim by one client against another client. Right? That's a limitation that flows out of the case law. So that's 1.7. Uh, 1.8, I'm going to go very quickly here. This 1.81, this is former Rule 3300, uh, lawyer client business transactions. The underlying idea here is for, that the lawyer is in a position to exercise undue influence over the client. And so the rule sets out the requirements in order to sort of overcome the presumption that the transaction is prohibited as an exercise of undue influence. And what you need to do, right, is you, the transaction has to be fair and reasonable substantively. Uh, it has, and the lawyer's role and, uh, and the terms have to be fully disclosed and transmitted in writing. The change here is that you have to describe your own role in the transaction in a way that is clear to the client. Right? Um, the other big change is that you, the client either has to have independent counsel or you, the lawyer, and this is the change, have to advise in writing that they seek independent counsel. You can't any longer say it might be you know, it might be helpful for you to have independent counsel. You, should, you have to say, you should get independent counsel. My advice to you is that you get independent counsel. Um, and um, 
uh, then there must be informed written consent. Right? Um, so that's basically 1.8, and there are a lot of other interesting conflict rules we're not talking about. 1.9 right, represents a huge clarification of the law with respect to former clients. Right? The basic idea is that you can't act for a present client against a former client in the same or substantially related matter that you handled uh, for the former client, right? Unless the client gives informed written consent. Right? So again, informed written consent is uh, often going to be critical. Right? Um, Again, the idea of the, the critical idea here, the term matter is defined in 1.7 very broadly. Uh, same matter, we kind of understand. That's the side switching problem. You can't jump from one side of a matter to the other uh, on behalf and oppose a former client or seek to undo what you did for that former client. Substantial relationship is a term that was not in the prior rules, right? Um, and it's very loosely defined in the comments, right, as uh, a substantial relationship is a, a kind of case where you would normally have gotten information, right, in the first matter, which is relevant to the second matter, and you'd want to use, right? That's the underlying idea. The reality is that we're all going to be thrown back on case law for sorting this stuff out. And it's going to be uh, continue to be complicated, but at least the rule points you to the right legal test, right? Uh, in a way that it did not uh, before. Um, nine part B of the rule talks about situations where the uh, where you are no longer associated with the firm that represented the client. Right? So this is a former client of a firm where you worked, right? but you did not, quote, represent the client. Right? Uh, in those situations, you're not disqualified, essentially, unless you actually acquired material confirmation on financial information relating to the representation. So a case may have been very active in your office when you were associated with it. But if you didn't represent the client and you didn't obtain confidential information right, about the client, then you are not disqualified by virtue of your former firm having done that work. Now you bring those together. These are two situations then, right? One where you formally represent the client, the other where you didn't, but your firm did, right? And, and in those two situations, 1.9c talks about your duties with respect to the former client's confidential information that you have. And the short answer is, can't use or disclose without informed written consent, essentially. Okay, 1.10, imputation, right? This is where things, the stakes get very high because this is where the question of when a conflict between uh, an individual conflict uh, runs to a whole firm, right, including every lawyer worldwide. Right, right? So in these kinds of uh, situations, right, we're talking about the basic rule of imputation is when lawyers are together in the same firm and in, a sen in essence have remained there, right, then imputation follows for 1.7 conflicts and 1.9 conflicts, with only a couple of exceptions. One important exception, if it's based on the personal interest of a lawyer, uh, and it's not something that would impair the rest of the lawyers in the firm. So for example, I, um, uh, I, uh, I, I personally detest a particular cause and could never be associated with it, but my colleagues are fine, right? I have a personal conflict, I couldn't do it, but it's not imputed to them. Uh, the other is uh, in a situation where a lawyer who's disqualified under 1.9, right, um, that is to say a person who actually represented the client or who <coughs> has confidential information of the client, um, is, is screened 
right? And the rules define screening effectively as in a good way that to spell out what the goal is, which means isolating, right? Uh, in a way that their confidential information can't get out. And that has to be timely screened. The person has to get no fee. There has to be written notice. And here's the, the real note, right? This only applies, screening only applies, and this is where California has made a choice. The screening approach only applies where the prohibited lawyer did not substantially participate in the earlier matter. Notice that's an interesting, unde largely undefined term, right? There is a comment, but it's new law in a lot of ways, and there'll be litigation about it. But the idea essentially is you should be able to say, well, yeah, I did represent the client, but I only wrote one memo on a peripheral issue, right, um, for example. Or uh, I didn't represent the client, and I just had one water cooler conversation, and uh, um, and uh, so I had no substantial participation in the case. Screening, if it's done in a timely manner, is supposed to work in those situations. Um, the second situation in 1.110b is where the lawyer who's represented the client has left the firm, right? <clears throat> in, that, in that situation where the lawyer is gone, the, the, the first part of the rule where the lawyers are still all associated together is gone. Right? And imputation stops, right? So that you no longer, uh, if the lawyer who represents the client and the client have left, the only person who is disqualified is a lawyer who's left in the firm who still has confidential information relating to the matter, right? And um, so uh, that's a, a break in the imputation pattern. Finally, duties to a prospective client. This is a really important uh, body of law uh, that was largely in cases and ethics opinions and has now been elevated to the rules. The essential idea here is, first of all, you might ask, who is a prospective client? Well, it's somebody who directly or through an agent, right, an authorized representative, who might be, for example, another lawyer, right, approaches you, right, uh, consults for the purpose of retaining or securing legal services or advice from a lawyer in a lawyer's professional capacity. So this is essentially the kind of initial interview stage or the initial communication stage. It may or may not lead to a representation. Obviously, if it leads to a representation, right, then you've got a separate set of issues because now that person is a client, present client. If they're fired they, or they fire you, they're a former client. So this is for situations where that initial conversation or consultation doesn't lead to representation, right? And so 1.18b says that even if no lawyer-client relationship ensues, um, if you got relevant confidential information from a client, a prospective client during that initial interview, you may not use or reveal it. Right? So you have former client obligations with respect to that person, with respect to their confidential information. Now here's what's even trickier. Right? You can't act adversely to them right? uh, in the same or substantially related matter if you've got relevant protected information. And 1.18c says that in ordinary circumstances, that is to say absent protective measures by you, that disqualification is imputed to your firm. So you have this situation now where the, this is already, already there, but now it's expressed, right? That if you've got the confidential information, uh, you are, um, uh, you, your firm is potentially disqualified. Now there's an important exception. One obvious one is, of course, the former client, excuse me, the prospective client and the actual client with whom there's a conflict can both give informed written consent. But the more interesting thing is when will screening be permitted, right? When can somebody who got confidential information that's relevant to a matter be screened from that matter in such a way as to permit the rest of the firm to proceed? And the answer is uh, that screening, if it's done in a timely manner, and if the lawyer gets no fee participation and if there's written notice, will work if the lawyer who did the interview took reasonable measures 
to avoid exposure to more information than reasonably necessary to determine who to represent. Now that's a mouthful, right? Because it's, you've got to take reasonable measures not to get more information than is reasonably necessary to determine what's necessary. So there's a sort of a murkiness there. On the one hand, is that, for example, is that what, what kind of information would that include? Is that just enough to do a conflict check? which might be the narrow reading. I think a more sensible reading would be enough to figure out whether you have the expertise and whether the client can pay you and a variety of other things that are relevant in the initial interview. But it does suggest that in any law firm of any size, there ought to be a policy with respect to initial interviews about what is said, what is not said, um, what kind of information you collect, and there should be a record of initial interviews that have been done so that screening can be implemented, right, with respect to lawyers who have conducted them in order to not bar the rest of the firm from other situations. Okay, I'm done. I'm sorry. I think that was probably a little long. But <coughs> Very enjoyable. Okay. So. Yes. So we're now going to move um, from the rules that we've been discussing, which are very much client focus, to rules. Um, the title of this section is Advocate, and it's, it's rules that really relate to your duty to the legal system, to the court, and even to opposing parties. So um, the ones we're going to cover are uh, a new rule on uh, prohibiting certain actions that delay litigation. Uh, a rule on the duties of candor toward the tribunal, uh, a rule concerning fairness to opposing party and counsel, then rule uh, lawyer's witness, which uh, is not a new rule, but we'll discuss the nuances of, of, of 3.7, and a, um, another interesting new rule, uh, advocate in a non-adjudicative proceeding. So delay of litigation. Um, this is quite a short little rule. It says simply, in representing a client, a lawyer shall not use means that have no substantial purpose other than to delay or prolong the proceeding or to cause needless expense. Um, they, um, as we know, uh, there are other rules in uh, throughout that have sort of similar concepts, but they are either more client-focused. For example, there's a rule on diligence. Uh, that requires that you, uh, the lawyer, be diligent and avoid delay, and that's one where the, the, the concern is protecting the client from the lawyer's lack of diligence. Uh, and Rule 3.1 uh, says that a lawyer for a, in, a, in a criminal action may require the prosecution to prove every element. Uh, this is to balance out any implicate. Um, uh, the purpose of 3.1 would be to make clear that in a criminal situation, uh, uh, due to constitutional requirements, a lawyer, a defense lawyer, can actually require even uh, even where you might you might think that element uh, is so obvious. But but a lawyer in a, a, for a criminal defendant has um, is entitled to um, to require the prosecution to prove every element. And in addition, there's a statute that's related to uh, the, the no de the delay of litigation um, rule, and that requires um, that states that a that a lawyer um, mustn't uh, willfully delay the client's suit in, a, in a, with a view to his own gain. So that one is where the lawyer is doing it to have to make more fees or for some other personal purpose. But this one here is really about about the court and the judicial system. And, um, and requiring that lawyers don't uh, create delay <coughs> for its own purpose. Rule 3.3 uh, is uh, a rule concerning candor towards the tribunal. Uh, there is an existing rule, Rule 5200. Um, this is a more expansive rule, and it also uses uh, what I would consider more more clear and straightforward language. Our prior rule has some sort of flowery language, such as you, a lawyer shall not seek to mislead by an artifice. Uh, I think that term has maybe dropped out of usage, so it's, it's nice that the, uh, the commission saw fit to get rid of that. Um, so this rule uh, essentially says a lawyer may not 
knowingly make a false statement of fact or law. You can note on the slide in my zeal to make these slides simple and readable, um, I, I left out law there, but you're, you're not prohibited to make a false statement of fact or law. Um, you must, you are not prohibited to fail to correct your prior uh, material uh, false statement of fact or law. So if you real, if you at the time uh, had no notion that your statement was uh, false, but later come to know it, uh, you have an obligation to correct that false statement. And uh, you also have an obligation uh, to disclose controlling uh, directly adverse <coughs> legal authority. Um, presuming that it's not uh, disclosed by the opposing counsel, which it usually will be. Um, and finally, uh, a lawyer is prohibited from offering evidence that the lawyer knows to be false. Uh, the rule also uh, states helpfully uh, that the lawyer is, um, in civil cases, a lawyer um, may be uh, refused to offer evidence uh, that the lawyer reasonably believes is false. And I think that's, that's, a, that's useful for lawyers to have that notion in the rules um, in the instance where you have a client who's pushing the lawyer to, uh, to do something that the lawyer uh, has a belief it would be false. And I think that that's going to provide some helpful backup for the lawyer to say, you know, no, I can't do that. Um, what's new specifically in this rule is a definition of when, the, when this, how long this duty lasts, and what, and what we're told is that the duty continues into the, until the conclusion of the proceeding, which is defined in the comments. Uh, so with respect to your duty to correct something you misstated, uh, that, that's how the duty lasts until the proceeding is over. And there's a new addition that with respect to ex parte proceedings where the other side is not present, uh, and you have a duty to disclose material facts um, including uh, ones that are not helpful, uh, it, whether or not the facts are adverse to the position of your client, or as I put it, including the bad ones. <coughs> also has an interesting discussion of remedial measures. So Rule 3.3 .3 spends a lot of time talking about um, if, what a lawyer needs to do when a client um, uh, or a witness that's called by the lawyer has offered um, evidence that the lawyer comes to, know, comes to know is false, or where the lawyer uh, intends to engage, uh, knows that the client intends to engage, is engaging, or has engaged in criminal or fraudulent conduct. Uh, and the comments to this rule give the lawyer some guidance on what the lawyer is to do in this situation. Uh, the, the comments uh, discuss the fact that the lawyer um, should explain to the client uh, the lawyer's obligations, including not to mislead the, uh, the tribunal to remonstrate with the client to take corrective action if it's the client or to allow the lawyer to take uh, corrective action and uh, discuss with the uh, the client uh, the possibility of needing to, needing to withdraw. But importantly, remedial measures do not include disclosure of client confidential information. Um, so again, we go back to what we began with, with Judge Chu, Chu noting. We have this rule, uh, this very broad, the rule of confidentiality in the Business and Professions Code, and again and again we see that surfacing and limiting other obligations of the lawyer. Okay, Rule 3.4 is uh, obligations of fairness to opposing counsel and party, and uh, opposing party and counsel. Um, And this rule uh, essentially goes through a list of things that the lawyer is not is is prohibited from doing. 
uh, it's, it's reasonably self-evident the lawyer uh, should not uh, unlawfully obstruct another party's access to evidence, conceal documents, suppress evidence that the lawyer or the client has a legal ob obligation to produce or reveal, falsify evidence, or, and then it, it shifts to a list of, uh, of, of, of prohibitions regarding witnesses. You're not prohibited to uh, counsel a witness to testify falsely, uh, offer an illegal inducement, or compensate a witness contingent on the content of the testimony. Now, there, the, uh, the drafters were cognizant of the fact that there are situations where uh, a lawyer is going to compensate a witness. And so the rule specifies that it's permissible to compensate a witness in certain circumstances. And those are, you're permitted to pay a witness uh, their reasonable expenses that are occur um, incurred in attending and testifying, reasonable compensation for loss of time, and finally, a reasonable fee for a professional services of an expert. So these are things we would expect. but. Um, None of those can be uh, contingent on testifying in a certain way. That would violate Rule 3. In addition, these are additional prohibitions in Rule 3.4. Uh, the lawyer uh, may not advise a person to make himself unavailable. Uh, to, and the lawyer is also uh, prohibited from knowingly disobeying an obligation under the rules of the tribunal, except for an open <coughs> refusal. Uh, so this is this is a carefully nuanced concept. But there are maybe circumstances where a lawyer openly says to the court, uh, "I understand the court's ruling, but this is this is how I'm proceeding. I believe that's error. That's that will not be considered under this rule uh, a violation of Rule 3.4." Otherwise, you have an obligation uh, not to knowingly disobey an obligation of the court. Uh, and finally, and this comes directly from our old rule, uh, a lawyer may not assert personal knowledge of facts in issue except in two circumstances when they're testifying or, um, no, that's the only exception, when they're testifying. Uh, and they um, also may not state a personal opinion as to guilt or innocence. So that's simply the notion that you can't, if you're, if you're the advocate, uh, you're, not to, uh, in, you, it's, you're not permitted to uh, make statements as to facts. You're not supposed to testify when you're not on the stand. Okay. And speaking of lawyers on the stand, uh, this is the Rule 3.7 uh, addresses the ethical rules relating to um, to lawyers as witnesses. And it's fairly similar to our prior rule, but it's expanded. Our prior rule was only, uh, only prohibited lawyers um, uh, from testifying in front of a jury. This now it's expanded uh, to all trials in front of a jury, a judge, or an administrative judge, or an arbitrator. Uh, the rule retains the same exceptions, which is a lawyer is permitted to testify as to an uncontested matter or the nature and value of legal fees. Uh, now, you are permitted to testify uh, with your client's informed written consent. Uh, but I thought it was interesting to note that in the comments, there's a note that the court, nonetheless, has discretion to take action up to and including disqualification to protect both the trier of fact and opposing party. So the notion with a lawyer as witness is that there can be a, 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 it can work to the um, to the depth, to the disadvantage of the client or potentially to the opposing party. Uh, it's possible that a lawyer um, uh, a lawyer testifying might um, might disadvantage the client, but if but if the client's not concerned, you can get informed written consent. But it's also possible that the lawyer testifying might be given uh, ex, uh, extra credence because they're the lawyer and the jury has watched them uh, arguing. And so in that instance, the fact that the client is perfectly prepared to give informed written consent doesn't do anything to help the opposing party. So comment three is there to tell the judge, you still have the authority to take action uh, to protect the opposing party or to protect the jury if you think the jury is going to be misled. And finally, uh, Rule 3.7 notes that there's no imputation. So uh, if, if a different lawyer 
Uh, if if a, one lawyer in the firm is going to need to testify, for example, a lawyer who drafted the contract that's now being uh, now at issue, uh, that that isn't going to require that the entire firm be disqualified uh, from representing the party. Uh, and the and the rule does note that that's as long as there's no other conflict under the general conflict rules of current client and, and former client. And lastly, we have Rule 3.9, uh, which requires for a lawyer is representing a client in front of a legislative body or an administrative agency in connection with a pending matter, the lawyer is obligated um, to disclose the fact that he or she is representing the client. Now, there are some exceptions to that. If the lawyer is seeking publicly available information from an agency, so a lawyer, if there's if there's information that's publicly available that the lawyer wants to get for his or her client, uh, the lawyer is not required in those instances to say, "Oh, I'm getting this because for for my client." Uh, also, in negotiation or in an investigation or examination of the client, you're not required. The lawyer isn't required to. Uh, disclose that they're representing a client. I have to admit, I, I find those last two exceptions a little bit uh, confusing. But the overarching concept is that if a, if a lawyer is attending um, a legislative uh, hearing or appearing before a legislative body or administrative agency, it, it's a matter of fairness to the public um, and, uh, and, the, and the body that the, the, the um, lawyer disclose that they're there for a purpose, for an interested purpose, and they represent a client. However, the lawyer is not required to disclose uh, the identity. This is from the comments. The lawyer is not required to disclose the client's identity. Um, so the lawyer, it's sufficient under this rule for the lawyer to state that they are representing a client. Um, and that's probably useful in some instances where it might actually be uh, a violation of the duty of confidentiality for the lawyer to be required to uh, to disclose that. So this this rule balances uh, the lawyer's different duties, and that ends our discussion of the advocate rules. So we have time for questions. We have time for questions. Can I? I I'd like to add one thing because I was sprinting in my presentation, and I'd like to mention one one other thing that I think is particularly interesting. Uh, and it's in the comments on the conflict rules. Let's jump back a little bit. In many cases, what you want to do as a lawyer when you uh, uh, ha are looking at this morass of conflict problems that potentially stares you in the face is to get a current client to agree that certain things won't count as conflicts, right? And essentially to waive them in advance. And you could waive a present client conflict in advance. So you might, for example, say in the waiver, I'm prepared, uh, uh, the client might be asked to say uh, that they're prepared to be sued in unrelated matters by other lawyers in your law firm. That's a very common kind of advance waiver, you know. Um, another kind of advance waiver might be uh, you won't, uh, to, in a joint client, situation, you might have one client say, if the clients come to a parting of the ways, the law firm gets to go with client A, and client B won't seek to disqualify uh, the lawyer. Uh, those would be examples of advanced waivers where you're using, um, uh, the, using uh, the power of contract to control uh, conflict exposure down the road. Right? Um, and uh, what's interesting is that the rule, 1.7, has an excellent comment, right, which basically says um, these things are possible. We don't opine necessarily on when they're fully possible, and we don't, they don't get into the circumstances, but they give you a lot of guidance in the comment to model rule 1.7 about situations where, and the big thing is, is there full disclosure to the extent you can make it? And is the client sophisticated? In particular, are they represented by in-house counsel, right? And so those fa that, that's a very <coughs> big step, right, for the rules to acknowledge that possibility 
to lay out some of the most important considerations. And it's in a comment to Rule 1.7, but if you jump to Rule 1.9 about former client conflicts, that language is referenced with approval, and it's clear that the advanced consent can be used to manage former client conflicts as well as concurrent conflicts. And I would just say I'm glad that, oh, question. How do you see, how do you see the case law that now interprets the old rules transferring over and applying to the new rules? And I was just going to add, actually, actually I was going to touch on what I was just going to say, which is this, this issue of advanced waivers is obviously one where there is a significant um, intersection between the disciplinary rules, which is what we're talking about, and then case law, which arises in the context of disqualification motions. And we have the recent case from the California Supreme Court uh, involving Shepard Mullen, which, con which uh, dealt with the enforceability of an advanced waiver to prevent disqualification and also how it applied to uh, whether the law firm was required to disgorge fees. So if you notice, uh, comment nine, which is what Steve was just talking about, which is the comment to 1.7 that addresses advanced waivers, and it talks about the fact that advanced waivers you know, may be obtained, they, they aren't precluded, and it, and it goes on to give quite a bit of information. It doesn't reference any case law, and, and there is quite a bit of case law not only the recent Shepard Mullen case, which of course is too recent for the comments to incorporate, but there's a lot of federal court case law in California which construes uh, advanced waivers and, uh, and applies the existing California law. And this is just an interesting place where, you know, for disciplinary purposes, uh, I think it's an interesting question to which, uh, the, to the extent to which disqualification law as applied by the courts and as interpreted by the courts is going to affect, you know, how this rule is applied for disciplinary purposes. And I, I don't think we have a lot of guidance here. Um, uh, but, you know, the rule says what it says, and it certainly says that, uh, in term, that, that lawyers are not precluded from obtaining an advance waiver. I mean, that's what comment nine does give us. But it's going to be an interesting development. My question was more general, though. My question meant, as a gen like all the rules here have been interpreted both by the disciplinary system but also in, in the court system. Is it what's your anticipation now as we go forward with citing to um, the case law that interpreted the old rules? Um, the goal in drafting the rules was to conform them to the maximum extent possible with existing case law. Um, if you notice through the rules and the comments, there actually are what I would say minimal citation to case law, and that was purposeful. Uh, the case law that was typically cited in the comments were cases that were what I would say well-established ethical rules to the extent possible, <clears throat> and, and they're not that common. And the goal was to draft the rules, and obviously it was a goal, who knows if it was completely successful, but was not to change existing case law, but also to recognize the possibility that existing case law could change. So, you know, I can't, there's various rules where they cite, you know, the language is kind of wishy-washy on purpose, because there's an acknowledgement that, you know, some of this is going to have to be developed further, and that certainly previous case law could be changed. So, you know, there are times when you see language like to the extent possible or reasonably necessary. That language was somewhat purposely vague in recognition that case law is going to have to develop some of this and that case law could change. So that was a general goal, and that was actually part of the Supreme Court's mandate, which was to conform this as much as possible to existing California law while still trying to bring California in line with the rest of the country to the extent possible with respect to the model rules. One, uh, one other comment on that I think is worth thinking about. You're, you cannot use any case, right, that was to, you know, if you're, if you're trying to argue for an interpretation of the rules, you can't use any case uncritically. You have to look and see whether it's reasoning and result was carried forward in the current rules, right? 
if, if the reasoning and the result wasn't carried forward, there's a very serious argument that it's no longer good law, at least in the disciplinary context, right? So my question um, goes to conflict of interest. Um, screening procedures in small law firms. And I've heard some commentary under the old rules that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to implement effective screening procedures in small law firms. And I'm wondering if the new rules, the new comments address that and provide any clarity or, or assistance for those of us in smaller firms. Uh, I don't think there's anything in the new rules that expressly talks about the question of whether screening is available in a small law firm. Right. Uh, I would well, sorry, yeah. Stephen. Go ahead. I would add, there's actually a recent case, and I can't give you a site off the top of my head, but it's very recent, it's within the last six months, I believe, from the out of the Court of Appeal, which dealt with a, um, a question of the size of the office and, and screening, and the, and the courts of that. Um, that, that. That's not the question. The question is, was, you know, did the lawyer get the information or not? And so it was kind of a helpful for a small firm notion that screening is possible. I was going to say something similar because I think the way that the rules read right now, they basically take the proposition that the question is whether the person was effectively isolated, right? And I think that courts are going to be sympathetic to firms that take strong measures to make sure that somebody is isolated. They, in the, you know, the, there's a real effort to make sure that the case isn't discussed in their presence, that they don't get information related to it, that they don't have access to the files and so forth. That kind of measure, I think, is given more force by the current rules because of the focus on whether, it, but, but it's, it's an open question, you have to say, at the end of the day. And there's dicta in the Kirk case, which you know creates some doubt. Is probably what you're referring to. Uh, it raised a question as to how effective screening could be in a small firm. That's still going to be there. But you know, I, I think that's right that there is nothing in these rules which would prohibit screening in a small firm. I just want to go back to the earlier question. Um, if you look at the, new, the case that just came out, the, the the Shepard, 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 Shepard case, they actually begin the discussion about the new rules and the old rules. There's some footnote in there that does begin to discuss um, how it applies and whether or not it would be different under the new rules. So they, they, they began the dialogue, they just haven't necessarily fulfilled and answered the question completely, but they have definitely began the dialogue on that. I was just curious about uh, Rule 151, um, the change to uh, the rule about behaviors among lawyers, and um, does the panel see that having any effect on how uh, class counsel might go about splitting fees, or is that just all taken care of by 151B, um, and it's a, the rule does not apply to vision of fees pursuant to court order? Judge Chu, I don't know if you have any actual recollection of how this was, of what the, the Rules Revision Commission intended. Um, it, it seems to me that Section B is addressing both a, a class situation when a, when a court issues an order, you know, allocating fees, or any other situation outside of a class council where there's a court order um, apportioning fees. This is really, the, the intent of the fee division among lawyer rules is to um, ensure that clients know, you know, how a fee is being divided, and so there's no sort of uh, influence on a lawyer that a client's not aware of around, you know, who's sharing in the fee and to what extent. And with a with orders that are issued after the fact, that same principle isn't implicated. So And that's my recollection. Uh, you know, I think my recollection of the division of fees was the idea was to protect the clients as much as possible. But when a court is supervising that division of fees as a neutral third party arbiter, that risk is significantly less, one would hope, <laughs> and, um, and, and that it wouldn't be covered by that situation if there is a court order. Now, it's, it's fair to say that I think that in 
in some situations, right, uh, not all the arrangements between class counsel are disclosed to the court, right? And it would be hard to rely on that rule if the court order hadn't been premised on the actual uh, disclosure of all the arrangements. Any other questions? It's a question for Judge uh, Chu, I believe. You were talking about 1.2.1. Is non-fraud civil liability considered a violation of law for purposes of that rule? <coughs> I'm sorry, non-fraud civil liability? Negligence, an ethical violation, breach of contract. The clients often come to you with those types of problems and they want advice. You know, that's a good question. Um, I would say that this is one where I, I think it's going to have to be a little bit further developed. Uh, it depends on whether a violation of law, rule, or ruling of a tribunal. I think it would be covered in terms of a ruling of a tribunal. Yeah. In other words, it would cover case law to the extent that case law is clear. And, and that's usually where the rub lies, at least typically when you're advising clients. Back when I had clients. But, um, you know, case law is rarely black and white, and, and there's probably a lot of room for interpretation. And the rule, I don't think, is intended to, you know, prevent a lawyer from exploring the nuances of case law as well as the law or statutes, and, and not to hamstring it, but to address those situations where it really is clear that a client is going to be committing a violation of the law where there's not a whole lot of interpretation involved. But, you know, obviously this is an area that's going to be subject to further interpretation and development in determining to what extent a violation of a law or a case law is going to result in discipline. Right. And on your specific question, at least with respect to breach of contract, there's a lot of law around the country that's been cited in uh, connection with the model rules. Um, pretty clear that, that a breach of when a contract somebody comes in and says, "I don't want to pay," that's not that's not the same, yeah. right? Uh, uh, so ordinarily, if the client says, "I'm not paying," that was a bad deal, or "I'm not paying," I don't have the money, or whatever the reason is. You can counsel them with respect to that ordinarily. I think at least that's the result around the re most of the country. Thank you. And I guess I'd let, let one last note on that is that comment four to the rule also says that a lawyer may advise a client on the consequences of violating a rule, uh, law, et cetera. So uh, that the kind of analysis that Steve just talked about, where, you know, well, if you breach that contract, this is what's going to happen. Um, is also expressly permitted under that comment. And that's where comment one, I think, also comes into play. Um, there's a difference between legal analysis and recommendation. Uh, you know, you can advise them about the breach of contract, but you can't, it's probably not appropriately if you think it's going to be a breach to recommend that we breach the contract, unless it's a form of simple disobedience or something of that sort. But it's safer to refer, you know, the rule allows you to analyze it legally and explain your legal analysis to the client. Well, I think that's the perfect time for us to end, right on time, and thank you all. Uh, next panel starts. We'll, we'll take a break for 15 minutes, and next panel is at 11.15. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The majority of my practice involves uh, legal malpractice in the court. I also represent the court. It's hard to hear you. Oh. Okay. 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 Here, is this better? Okay. I wasn't speaking to the mic. My apologies. Um, the majority of my work involves legal malpractice and ethics work. I'm a recent member, uh, cycled off the Committee for Professional Responsibility and Conduct, which is putting on this uh, presentation here today. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Good morning. My name is Dina Roach, and I'm, in a, I'm a partner at O'Reilly & Roach in San Francisco. And uh, I provide advice and counsel to lawyers and law firms uh, primarily related to partner departures and attorney transitions, um, as well as various related partnership issues. I also provide advice and counsel related to legal ethics issues and as outside general counsel to firms. I'm a current member of the COBRAC committee and I'm also pleased to be here this morning with you all. Good morning, my name is Justin Fields. I'm a partner in Join Morris's San Francisco office. Uh, my practice concentrates in professional liability matters, representing lawyers and law firms, and providing uh, ethical uh, advice to lawyers. And I'm also a current member of COBRA. Great. So uh, I'm going to begin with the rules covering transactions with persons other than clients. Uh, and really, these rules really focus more, I think, mostly on communications with persons other than clients. And beginning with Rule 4.1, which talks about truthfulness and statements to others. Uh, this is part of the rules that I used to like to call, don't lie, cheat, or steal. Which seems like a common sense proposition, but uh, uh, oftentimes it, it's necessary to make it clear in the written rules. Um, the important thing to note about Rule 4.1 is that it covers any statement made by the lawyer in the course of his or her representation of a client. And that would also include advocacy between legislative and administrative bodies covered by 3.9. And there's no counterpart in the previous rules of professional conduct, but what it does is clarifies the existing the obligations under existing statutory law, like Business and Professions Code 6068D. And although this seems somewhat harsh, one thing that the rule does make clear, and this is made clear in comment one, that rule 4.1 doesn't necessarily prohibit omissions on its face. So a failure to disclose, unless it's necessary to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act by a client, does not necessarily constitute a false statement. But that also has to be tempered by the fact that statements that may be partially true but are misleading or can be deemed false because of a material omission may be considered a false statement. And um, in the slide, there's a reference to a couple of ABA formal opinions that construe the model role counterpart. Um, the first one is uh, opinion 95397 that talks about the death of a client and whether it would be a false statement not to say something in the course of a representation without explaining that your client has died. <clears throat> and that, in that opinion, was deemed to be an implied misrepresentation because it implies that you still have a client when you are speaking, that you're actually speaking on behalf of your client. Um, <clears throat> Those type of misrepresentations are covered by this rule, and the notion is, is that if you make a statement that is partially true but becomes false because of something you omitted or extremely misleading, that that 
should be prohibited as well. And that's something I used to deal with all the time when I practiced dealing with false advertising claims, for example. Um, it's not clear, obviously, whether that case law would be applicable in this disciplinary rule, but that conception that a failure to disclose could be considered an affirmative misrepresentation is recognized in this rule. Um, now, this is mitigated by a certain couple of things. One, it requires actual knowledge by the attorney. You actually have to know that it's false or misleading. It's not a object, it's not a reasonable person standard in actual knowledge. So, of course, actual knowledge can be inferred through the circumstances. The other thing is it only applies to material statements of fact. It does not apply to opinions. And comments one and two make clear that rule 4.1 often will not apply to representations made by the client in documents drafted by the lawyer or in negotiations. And comment four is another really important comment. This does not cover lawful investigative techniques. Um, the most common ones are when um, <clears throat> prosecutors use sting operations. There's going to be an element of deception that is inherent in those type of investigation, and this rule is not intended to prohibit those type of operations. So rule 4.2 covers communications with a represented person. And this rule largely carries forward the substance of Rule 2-100. Uh, one of the most significant changes, however, is it changes um, party to person in, in order to sort of broaden the application of the rule or to make it clear that it applies to any represented person. Uh, this was done in order to conform this rule with case law, applying Rule 2-100 outside litigation. It also conforms with the rule adopted by just about every other jurisdiction, if not every other jurisdiction in the country. It also avoids the limits of the term party as defined in some of the case law. And it was deemed to be more protective of the public. And most importantly, there's no evidence in other jurisdictions that have adopted this rule that it has somehow inhibited criminal investigations. Uh, I think the biggest concern was expressed by criminal practitioners that this would somehow affect their ability to conduct investigations. And it was deemed in reviewing this rule that given that this rule has been applied in many other jurisdictions without an effect, that this rule should be adopted. <clears throat> uh, this rule makes clear in 4.2b that it applies to all organizations, including governmental entities. 4.2b also makes clear what is clear in the case law, that it only applies to current officers or employees of that organization and not former officers or employees of that organization. Uh, one deletion that occurred was uh, it no longer covers constituents of an organization whose statement may constitute an admission on the part of the organization. That was in the previous rule. That phrase for who would be covered uh, was, has been dropped in the model rule and omitted by most states. It was deemed to be somewhat ambiguous because it uses the word may. It also was viewed to place an undue burden on lawyers to analyze the rules of evidence and the laws of agency to determine who they may or may not speak with. And finally, um, there's a belief that typically only statements by officers, et cetera, in subdivision, in the, in the previous paragraph would make statements that would constitute admissions, so it probably wasn't going to be that necessary anyways. Um, the other important aspect of the rule to keep in mind is that terms are now defined in 4.2d, including the terms managing agent and public official. Um, and this is another one where the comments are very helpful. Comment 2 makes it clear that the rule applies outside of litigation. Uh, I think most people think of this rule as applying in litigation context, but it applies, for example, in a contract negotiation. Um, comment 5 took what used to be in the black letter of the rule and moved it, interestingly, to a comment. Uh, this has to do with a client seeking an independent second opinion. And the reason it was moved to the comment, because it was recognized that under the black letter of the rule, it doesn't apply to an independent lawyer because the rule only covers statements made in the course of a representation of a client. And an independent lawyer is not representing a client when they're speaking with somebody who's seeking a second opinion. So that was deemed why 
this aspect of the comment was moved from the black letter rule, which it was in the previous model rule, into the comment. And then comment eight is another um, thing indicating that this is not intended to apply to lawful investigations. And this is another example where the added exception for court orders in 4.2 was added. It's the notion that if, it, if an investigation is lawful, that this is therefore permitted by law, and it also creates the option of, say, a prosecutor or somebody going in for a court order to make it clear that this is permissible. 4.3 has to do with communications with an unrepresented person. And again, this is a rule where there is no direct counterpart in the previous rule. But it, what it does is it expands on the concept found in Rule 3-600D concerning how a lawyer must deal with an organization's constituents. So what it does is really take those principles in that previous model rule and expands it more broadly to apply to any unrepresented person. So this rule also reflects prohibitions found in the case law, and it was modeled after rule, model rule 4.3. Now, the two important things to understand about this rule is first, that it is a lawyer's obligation to make clear that the unrepresented person understands that the lawyer is not a disinterested party. So first, there's a prohibition. You can't imply that you're disinterested when you're not, which is fairly common sense. But the second duty is that if you have a reason, if you reasonably should know that the unrepresented person incorrectly believes that you, the lawyer is disinterested, that lawyer has a duty to correct that. So it really needs to be clear to the unrepresented person if you as a lawyer are representing a client and communicating with that unrepresented person, that that unrepresented person realizes that you are not a disinterested party, that you actually have an, you know, I wouldn't say agenda, but you have a person who you are representing that whose interests you are looking out for and not necessarily for the unrepresented person. The other aspect is if there is a conflict of interest, then your permissible communications are significantly circumscribed. You may not provide any legal advice except a secure standard. And the important part about this part of the rule is that there is an objective standard. The lawyer must know or reasonably should know that there is a conflict of interest. Now, with respect to the conflict of interest provision of this rule, um, the court declined to adopt the model rule, which actually requires a lawyer to anticipate potentially when his or her interest might become adverse to the interests of the unrepresented person in the future. This was deemed by the commission to be too severe and too difficult to apply and leading to a lot of a host, what I believe would be a host of problems. So it was not adopted in the California rule, even though it is in the model rule. So this is another one where the comments are helpful. Comment two talks about what is permitted. And the idea was to make it clear that to recognize that oftentimes lawyers deal with unrepresented parties, whether oftentimes in litigation or in any a lot of other type of transaction. And it is not a violation of this rule to state your client's legal position. And in particular, in the course of negotiations, it is not a violation of this rule to discuss terms and most importantly, to provide the lawyer's own view of the meaning of those terms. That is not a violation of this rule. You are still able to negotiate with unrepresented parties and try to determine appropriate terms between your client and that unrepresented party. Now, subdivision B is another portion that is not found in model rule 4.3, though it is found in a similar concept in model rule 4.4a, which was not adopted by the California Supreme Court. And subdivision B was added to add greater protection for attorney-client privilege and the rights of unrepresented parties, and makes it clear that you cannot try to get an unrepresented party to divulge attorney-client privilege or otherwise confidential information. So the last rule is rule 4.4 that I am talking about, 
under this rule, and this is to allude to a question from the previous session, this was one where the rule was adopted to codify existing case law within the rule. In Rico versus Mitsubishi, a California Supreme Court case, that case dealt with the obligations of a lawyer when a writing is inadvertently transmitted um, that is confidential. Uh, and you know this often occurs these days in the electronic age, given how easy it is to press a button and send something that you don't intend to send to somebody. The important thing to recognize, and this rule is basically derived from Rico versus Mitsubishi, the important thing to recognize first is that it is an objective standard. First, it must be reasonably apparent that the document was transmitted inadvertently, and also the lawyer must know or reasonably should know that the document is privileged or protected by the work product doctrine. And this is to a certain extent a clarification on RICO. Uh, RICO does use the language obviously appear, but it also later clarified that the standard should be objective, which is why this rule establishes an objective standard. Subdivisions A and B then describe the duties that were mandated by RICO when a lawyer receives writings that they objectively understand are privileged and were inadvertently transmitted. And basically those standards are pretty self-explanatory. You have to refrain from reading that writing more than necessary to determine that it is privileged. And second, you need to promptly notify the sender. Now, comment two establishes an important exception. This rule only applies to inadvertently transmitted writings. It does not apply to the situation where the sending person purposely disclosed, presumably inappropriately, information that is privileged or otherwise confidential, where the sending was not inadvertent. And that area is covered by California case law in Clark versus Superior Court. This rule is not intended to cover that situation. And I'll pass it over to you. Yeah. Thank you. So next we're going to be covering rules 5.1 and 5 um, through 5.3. Um, and these are the rules um, related to conduct of attorneys within law firms and associations with respect to how they um, uh, deal with one another individuals that they are working with regardless of the size of the firm or the organization or the types of legal services that are provided so a couple notes which is that there's more there's more rules in this section under rule five um, we're going to cover these three which are significant because they represent uh, some new rules with without a prior counterpart the other thing to recognize is within these rules that we're going to be discussing, there's going to be a reference to the term law firms. This is another one of those terms that's that's uh, defined specifically in 1.0.1. It's an asterisk term, and it really encompasses, you know, an entire organization of lawyers, including sole proprietorships, governmental organizations. It, it's trying to express the gamut of anyone that is practicing law. So it's important to look at that and not to assume that because we're talking just about law firms that we're talking about you know, certain structures that practice law. Um, so let's get to the rules, specifically Rule 5.1. Uh, this deals with the responsibility of managerial and supervisory lawyers. Uh, prior to the enactment of the new rules, the only reference in the rules of professional conduct related to an attorney's duty to supervise was contained in the comments to the prior rule 3.110. And 3.110, which is now new rule 1.1, is the rule that Judge Chu was talking about first thing this morning related to an attorney's duty of confidence. So, um, and in that rule, um, you know, as you talk about rule 1.1 describes the lawyer's responsibility for his or her own professional conduct and 5.1, and then we'll talk about 5.3, which is very similar, but it deals with non-lawyers. Those are intended to you know, be an extension of this attorney's duties of competence when it applies to responsibilities to supervise um, and manage others within the law firm. So again, the, only, the comment really only stated that the duty of competence included a duty to supervise the work of subordinate attorneys and non-attorney employees or agents. That was the old rule. It was just a comment. And there was really 
It acknowledged the duty to supervise, but provided no guidance related to the scope of that duty or, or what was the expectation. And so these new rules, the, the, the goal of um, adopting these new rules is to provide that additional level of what is the scope of those duties. In subsection A, it describes that managerial lawyers within a law firm must make reasonable efforts to ensure the firm has reasonable measures in place to give reasonable assurances, you have some reasonableness standard here, um, that all the lawyers in that law firm comply with the rules of professional conduct in the State Bar Act. So again, they're imposing a reasonable standard on this duty to supervise. And really this, um, this rule, there's a lot of really helpful comments that I'm gonna talk about related to what does that duty to supervise and manage mean. Um, and, and really specifically with rule um, subsection A, you're talking about um, the expectation that managerial lawyers uh, are going to make reasonable efforts to establish policies and procedures at the firm that are designed to foster ethical conduct among all lawyers within that firm. And there are some examples in comment one, and I can go over some examples, you know, policies and procedures related to detecting conflicts of interest, you know, identifying dates which in which actions must be taken in pending matters, you know, accounting for client funds and property, you know, ensuring, ensuring that experienced lawyers are properly supervised. Those are some of the examples in, uh, in comment one. You know, it probably could and should include, we talked about, um, Steve mentioned in the earlier panel related to uh, the new rule on prospective clients and should firms have policies in place related to initial interviews and tracking those for the purposes of their conflicts policies. Um, and obviously developing electronic policies and practices within your firm to ensure that confidential information is inadvertently disclosed. We also talked recently just about, Judge Chu mentioned uh, 4.4, you know, the duty to uh, avoid or what, what you do when you have an inadvertent disclosure of a writing and, you know, Law firms do have duties to put reasonable measures in place to make sure that confidential information of clients remains confidential. Um, and so this is, you know, comment two to this rule also, there's an acknowledgement about what those measures might look like. And it acknowledges that this is going to be dependent on the size of the firm, uh, the structures in place of that firm, the nature of the practice. and so there's not going to be one right fit for every type of structure. And, you know, you can imagine that the expectations regarding how to implement policies related to tracking conflicts of interest are going to probably look very different in a two-person firm than in a, you know, large multinational thousand-plus lawyer firm. So it's important to recognize that the rules do understand that uh, there would be differences and could be different ways to achieve these uh, standards. But it's important to note that it is applicable to all firms, that all firms, law firms in the way that term is, de is defined, are expected to comply with the rule um, regardless of their size. So that's really important, that this is no longer really a risk management issue for firms. It's really a, a matter of professional responsibility, and it's important for a, you know, um, attorneys to understand that and is an extension of the duty of confidence. Um, there are some comments, additional comments under this subsection A uh, that comment three, for example, discusses the, the sort of the role of a managing lawyer in an office where you have uh, multi-office firms and whether that lawyer in, in, in office A is going to be responsible for the conduct of the firm as a whole in other offices and basically said that you know, you would expect that type of a firm structure to have an executive committee or other body in place that's going to come up with system-wide practices for the firms to ensure ethical compliance and conduct. But if that managing attorney um, learns about, um, knows or reasonably should know about that the body isn't providing or implementing these ethical measures, that they would have a duty to take corrective steps. Um, and then finally, comment four to this rule uh, contemplates the creation and implementation of reasonable guidelines related to the assignment of work, um, assignment of cases, distribution of workload. So that's something that, that is also related to a duty of confidence in terms of how much work you give to um, particular lawyers within the law firm. What can they handle based on their experience um, and abilities and the subject matter and what you're asking them to do? That this is implied in that general duty of confidence that's being 
discussed here through responsibilities to manage firms. So going on to subsection B, um, lawyers with direct supervisory authority must make reasonable efforts to ensure that the lawyers that they supervise do comply with the rules of professional conduct and the State Bar Act. And the key thing about this subsection is that it includes lawyers not employed at the same firm. So it's important to remember that even if you're not in the same firm, we're talking about of counsel people, independent contractors. Um, it could be referring to local counsel in a situation where you're using local counsel for a matter. So it doesn't just mean your duties just relate to someone that's sitting in the same office with you or within your firm structure. Um, of course, whether a, dude, a lawyer has direct supervisory authority over another lawyer is going to be um, a question of fact, and that's just that's something that hasn't been defined in the rules, but it does you know, uh, give you an idea of, again, emphasizing the role to supervise uh, other attorneys within, within your office and beyond. The, um, the subsection B relates to when you would be responsible for another lawyer's violation. So um, this is only occurs in situations if you order the conduct or ratify the conduct. So that's, that's one set of situations. Or if you are a manager and supervisor and you know the conduct when it can be corrected, but you fail to take remedial measures to correct it. So it's not a vicarious liability or responsibility standard. It's, it's, there has to be these um, subparts have to be in place for one lawyer to be responsible for the conduct of another lawyer. Um, and common six says a managerial or supervisory lawyer must intervene to prevent avoidable consequences of misconduct if the lawyer knows the misconduct occurred. So that's kind of an embodiment of that rule and the duty to, to take remedial action. It's also important to know that even where this subsection C um, is not applicable. You know, for example, even in a situation where a lawyer may, maybe doesn't know of the conduct or ratify the conduct or order the conduct, that they could still be disciplined for a failure to supervise under subsection B. So I can give you an example of a situation in a subordinate attorney potentially stealing client funds from the trust account, for example. You know, you would imagine it's unlikely that the supervisory lawyer ordered it or ratified the conduct and, and maybe didn't find out about what happened until much, much later time, but there could still implicate the duty to supervise and, and, and potentially could still be disciplined for a duty to supervise something like that, which is so, you know, essential and obvious to how the, the office would be run and, and is really kind of goes to main ethical conduct of an attorney or a, a subordinate. Um, but... And along with that concept is the idea that all three of these paragraphs are, they create an independent basis for discipline. Um, but again, they're, they're not intending to impose a type of vicarious liability or responsibility. And really, I should use the word vicarious responsibility because a question of whether a lawyer could be liably, liable for such conduct criminally or civilly for the act of another attorney is beyond the scope of the rule, and that's, that's stated in comment eight. So this just deals with disciplinary issues and provides guidance for, for uh, lawyers managing other lawyers in their law firms. Uh, we're gonna go to 5.3 next because that is almost a mirror image of 5.1, except that it applies to non-lawyers. Um, and again, the only reference for the duty to supervise, like I said, was in that comment to prior rule 3.110. So the goal here is to ensure that the non-lawyer's conduct is compatible with the professional obligations of a lawyer. That's what these rules are seeking to, um, to really make sure that the attorneys understand their duties to fulfill that. So you have, you know, when you look at the rule and you have a copy of the rule, A and B and C are almost identical. You want... The, um, the lawyer to have, um, you know, they have the same duties and responsibilities to implement policies and procedures that guide ethical conduct. They have the duty to supervise. And then again, you know, they would only be responsible for the conduct um, of a non-lawyer if a violation of those rules would uh, uh, be, if, there was a, if it was engaged in by a lawyer, it would be a violation of the rules of professional conduct. So again, these are just the standards to non-lawyers. Um, the duty to manage and supervise, again, applies not just to employees, 
and independent contractors, but whether they're in-house or out-house, if you're using virtual help, if you're using offshore help, whatever it looks like, you still have this duty. And I think importantly in comment, the comment to these rules, it says that the lawyer must give instruction and supervision to this non-lawyer concerning all ethical aspects of the employment and should take into account that the non-lawyers may not have legal training. So if you know that someone's working with you that does not have legal training, that's just something that you need to keep in mind when you're giving them instructions about how to perform certain tasks um, related to the practice of law. 5.2 um, was, is again, another brand new rule uh, with no counterpart, but it's consistent with California case law. It basically says that lawyers have a duty to comply with the rules, even if it's under another lawyer's direction. And if another lawyer, um, you know, regardless of what type of direction another lawyer is giving you, you have an independent duty as a subordinate to follow the rules of professional conduct in the State Bar Act. And it provides a situation in which you can follow the direction of another lawyer, a managing lawyer may say, I want you to do the following things. And you really only can follow that direction if it's a reasonable resolution of an arguable question of professional duty. So if there was a discussion related to how to handle, for example, a situation involving conflicts of interest, and there was a disagreement about the best way to, to, to provide informed consent and what should really be said in that letter, you can imagine that that type of a situation would involve maybe reasonable interpretations of how to comply with the rules. And in those situations, a subordinate you know, can follow the rules. And, but if that's not the situation, the, and the subordinate believes that you know, the proposed resolution by this, this um, senior or managing attorney would result in a violation of the rules or the State Bar Act, they must communicate their professional judgment to the supervisor. So that's contained in um, the comment to 5.2. And, you know, as a helpful way, some people have said to remember your obligations. This is, this is not the Nuremberg defense. You, you can't discharge your own duties by saying that someone, you know, you're just following orders and somebody else told you to do that. So it really focuses on each lawyer's independent obligation to comply with the rules. And I think it's helpful to give, you know, less experienced lawyers sort of the tools to navigate these tricky situations in which, um, you know, they maybe disagree with the supervisor and, and certain types of disagreements that are okay and are reasonable and others where it's a clear violation that you're being asked to commit and really your obligation to say, you know, I believe this is a violation of those rules and not to just go for, you know, continue on with the instructions from the supervising attorney. So those are, I think these are really important additions to the new rules. Again, they're based on the model rules of professional conduct. Okay. I'll be covering the rules that we've uh, termed the, the rules regarding information about legal services, uh, rule 7.1 to 7.5, which are in many respects a, a recasting of, of former rule 1 400. The commission considered the ABA counterparts to rule 1 400, um, which again is, is uh, the number that we have now as reflected in 7.1 to 7.5. The commission recommended and the Supreme Court approved the ABA model rule framework for basically the rules with respect to advertising and solicitation as part of the goal in our new rules to promote a greater national uniformity in professional conduct rules. And that makes sense uh, for a number of reasons in this area. For one, we have widespread use of internet for marketing, we have trends in multi-jurisdictional practices, and all jurisdictions are subject to the same constitutional commercial speech doctrines in terms of regulation of uh, attorney advertising and solicitation. So having a consistent um, set of rules uh, here in California that is uh, similar to those in other jurisdictions will promote that goal of national uniformity. The, the foundational rule here is the first, 7.1, which is, uh, in terms of Section A, identifies uh, what this general prohibition against lawyers making false or misleading communications. 7.1a is pretty clear. It defines exactly what a false or misleading communication is, i.e., one that involves a material misrepresentation of fact or law, or two, one that omits a necessary fact to make the communication considered as a whole not mis materially misleading. 
i.e. no half-truths. Uh, 7.1a is basically a carry forward of the basic concept in 1400d about the, the prohibition of false and misleading communications is consistent with the model rule. The second part of 7.1, 7.1b, provides that standards can be formulated or adopted um, with respect to communications that will be presumed to violate this series of rules, 7.1 to 7.5. What's this is basically a carry forward of the enabling provision in 1400E, allowing the Board of Trustees to set forth standards. You might recall that in under 1400, there were about 15 or 16 standards, types of communications that were um, presumed to violate the rule and had an effect on the burden of proof in disciplinary matters. The commission recommended that those standards not be carried forward out of concern that as applied in disciplinary proceedings that they may lead to inconsistent results because of the burden shifting. However, um, that being said, the standards are very important guidance to lawyers and you'll see as we go through this, they're carried forward um, both in the black letter of some of these rules but also in the comments. Um, just to give you a, a sense of the standards that I'm talking about, uh, for instance, standard number one uh, addresses uh, lawyer communications about guarantees predictions or warranties about a particular result in a representation. That was presumptively violative of 1-400, and we'll see that carried forward. Uh, my favorite standard is what I, I call the ambulance chasing standard, um, which addresses the stereotype that lawyers chase ambulances. We don't, and we're not allowed to. Standard number four um, provides that communications transmitted at the scene of an accident or en route to a hospital are, uh, are not uh, permitted. The, uh, the con but notwithstanding that, the, the Board of Trustees still has the ability to formulate standards going, on a going forward basis. The comments to 7.1 are very helpful guidance in, in this series of rules. The first comment uh, highlights the breadth of 7.1, um, which makes clear that the rule governs all communications of any type whatsoever about a lawyer or the lawyer's services, including, as we'll discuss, advertising and, and solicitation. Comment two is an example of a carry forward of these prior standards that I just referenced. Comment two carries forward the specific one that I, I mentioned earlier, standard one, that, that a communication containing some sort of express guarantee or warranty of a particular result in a representation is considered false or misleading under 7.1. Comment three is, is very helpful in that it provides examples of statements that might be true um, but are nonetheless misleading and therefore violate the rule. For example, a statement that the, the client will uh, incur no fees without recovery but without an explanation that the client might still be responsible for costs in the representation is a, a half-truth. It's, it's false and misleading. And so the, the communication in that regard would have to address costs. And um, similarly, other uh, comments with, with respect to 7.1 uh, carry forward other standards, for instance, with respect to uh, a lawyer's uh, ability in, in, a, in, a, in foreign language has to be clear whether it's the, the lawyer or a member uh, of the firm, including a non-lawyer who has that uh, foreign language facility, and that's comment number five. And then the, finally, in terms of comments to 7.1, I'll just highlight number six, which cross-references the Business and Professions Code, which we're not in, going to get into much detail here today since we're focused on the rules, but just as a footnote, we have specific rules, you know, excuse me, specific provisions in our Business and Professions Code addressing both advertising and solicitation. The comments direct you uh, to those uh, sections that should be considered. 7.2 uh, addresses advertising, which is a subset of the communications covered by 7.1, and it's broken down into three subdivisions. A talks about permissible lawyer advertising, subject to the solicitation rule that we'll discuss next in 7.1 about false and misleading communications that we just discussed. <coughs> the lawyer may advertise through any written, recorded, or electronic means of communication. That's very broad. Any and means of in, in the terminology in A is meant to anticipate that there might be future modes of technology that lawyers use to communicate. So this is, in effect, meant to be a somewhat timeless way of describing the types of communication without limiting 
what the rule might uh, proscribe or address uh, based on future technological advancements. Section B uh, addresses the prohibition of lawyers paying for recommendations or the securing of legal ser services except as enumerated in subdivisions B1 through 5. So to give you an example of those exceptions, B1 addresses the fact that a lawyer may pay reasonable costs for an advertisement. Why does the rule say reasonable costs? Because an unreasonable cost might imply some sort of impermissible fee sharing with those that are facilitating the advertisement. Similarly, in B2, it talks about how a lawyer may pay the usual charges uh, to participate in a legal services plan or qualified uh, referral service. Again, usual connotes that's something that's unusual, that's um, perhaps over the top in terms of a charge, might um, lead into an impermissible fee sharing that would be prohibited. I also wanted to uh, highlight B4 as one of these exceptions, which addresses reciprocal uh, referral arrangements, which are a, a common practice in terms of connecting uh, lawyers with potential clients. Reciprocal referral arrangements are permissible, but there are two requirements. One is that the, it's a non-exclusive arrangement, and two, that the arrangement is disclosed to the, the prospective client or the consumer. The reason for these two requirements is to protect uh, the public, and it's considered to be sufficiently protective if the arrangement is non-exclusive and it's disclosed to the client. In terms of uh, the final subdivision, 7.2c, uh, this addresses uh, the disclosure of the lawyer's name or the law firm's name or contact information as part of an advertisement. Again, this goes to ensuring that the recipient is clear, excuse me, the, um, the person who is providing the content for the advertisement is clear to avoid any type of false or misleading communication. And we've already touched earlier on advertising standards. Uh, finally, uh, the, in 1400F, there was a requirement to retain uh, advertisements uh, or communications related to advertisements for two years. That's not carried forward in 7.2. Uh, that being said, there is still a business and professions code that requires a one-year retention of advertisements. Now, in terms of the comments to 7.2, uh, again, they provide more illustrative guidance as to what is and is not a permissible advertisement and carry forward certain standards uh, that uh, are sort of self-explanatory in comment number one. One thing to highlight, we talked briefly in the other panel about class action notices. It's uh, made explicit in comment number two that class action notices don't violate advertising rules. And finally, there are other comments that address the, the, the issue or concept, rather, of internal marketing uh, subject to the other professional conduct rules. It, it is permissible to use, utilize uh, internal marketers. And there's a further comment on reciprocal uh, referral agreements or arrangements, noting that it's important and, and required that lawyers not compromise their independent professional judgment when they enter into such arrangements. 7.3 covers solicitation. This regulates marketing of legal services through direct contact with potential clients. Uh, section 7.3A is a carry forward of 1400C. It basically covers what we traditionally understand to be an improper solicitation, a live, direct, in-person uh, type of solicitation that it, it, where the primary purpose is a sport, an eighth significant purpose is pecuniary gain for the attorney. And the reason for this traditional prohibition is this, this notion that lawyers are skilled in the persuasive arts, and we don't want to, I wish I'm sure we would all agree with it too, uh, and, and we don't want to overreach or unduly influence consumers with our great skills in persuasion. Now, uh, there is an exception here. Um, if your in-person or direct solicitation is to either a lawyer or someone with whom you have a family, close personal, or prior business relationship, uh, the prohibition does not apply. The comment uh, to this uh, rule number two also makes it clear that uh, in connection with um, public or char uh, charitable type of uh, work, pro bono work, um, that a lawyer is involved in, um, that doesn't uh, 
necessarily violate the in-person live type of solicitation because we want to promote access to justice. And in that instance, pecuniary gain is not the significant motive. Section B addresses prohibited solicitations and is a sort of a embodiment of prior case law that we have both at the state and uh, Supreme Court level, um, providing guidance or framework for what is and is not permissible regulation of trying to advertising or solicitations. Uh, some of that case law recognizes there are some instances where a total prohibition is acceptable. Uh, the two examples that are given in section B of 7.3 is one when the person who's being solicited said, I don't want any more of this, to not proceed further. Second, if the solicitation involves intrusion, coercion, duress, or harassment, it violates the rule. I think that's pretty commonsensical. We see um, in Rule 1400 there were other examples, threats, intimidation, and so on. Those are subsumed in these four terms, intrusion, coercion, duress, and harassment in B2. Section 7.3C um, carries forward the labeling requirement from uh, standard number five that we had in the, the predecessor uh, rule and basically advises that a, a lawyer has to provide in, some, in a written, recorded, electronic communication uh, some sort of indication, either explicit through the use of the term, this is an advertisement or words of similar effect, except uh, when uh, the communication is again to a lawyer or with respect to certain prior relationships covered in A2, or unless it is apparent from the, the context of the communication, that this communication is an advertisement. Here we don't, we want to protect consumers from misunderstanding that's, that the communication is some sort of official document requiring a response when in fact it's just an attorney solicitation. Prepaid and group legal services plans are not prohibited uh, by these solicitation rules and that's made explicit in subdivision D. Again, the idea here is that those types of plans promote access to justice uh, or for consumers, and there's less of a concern about the direct communication, direct solicitation, because someone other than the lawyer is making that communication to the consumer. And then finally, 7.3e, again, highlights what this rule is about. It's about directed uh, communications, targeted communications to sp specific consumers, and that's also highlighted by the first comment to this rule which describes that a lawyer's communication isn't a solicitation if it's directed to the general public, such as through a billboard. 7.4 regulates uh, communication uh, by a lawyer about fields of practice or claims to specialization. Now, um, this rule is basically a carry forward of 1400 D6 except uh, it sort of departs from the modern rule and is different than our, our prior rule 1400 and then it's and that it starts with a general prohibition which is more consistent with our new framework of rules and the general prohibition here is that a lawyer shall not state that he or she is a certified specialist unless he or she has a current certificate um, by a recognized organization i.e the board of legal specialization or some other entity accredited by the state bar and that certifying organization is clearly identified in the communication. From that general prohibition in <coughs> A, the second <coughs> provision, 7.4B, talks about permissible statements that a lawyer may communicate, even if that lawyer isn't a certified specialist. A lawyer may communicate that he or she does or does not practice in a particular field, specializes in a particular field, is limited to a particular field, or concentrates in a limited field, so long as that communication complies with 7.1, i.e. saying that the, con the concentration, specialization, limitation, et cetera, is, is not in any way false or misleading. There are no comments to this particular rule because the commission thought that its black letter was, was fairly clear. And one other departure from the model rule, which isn't particularly um, controversial, is that the model rule uh, calls out the areas of uh, admiralty and patent law, um, but that's really subsumed in 7.4b as um, the fact that, for instance, a lawyer could describe the fact that he or she specializes 
uh, or concentrates in patent or admiralty law. That's included in 7.4. Finally, uh, 7.5 addresses regulation of firm names and trade names. This is also sort of a carry forward of a, a language that we had for the most part in prior rules, like 1400A and, and various standards related to it. Again, as with 7.4, we start off with a general prohibition that a lawyer shall not use a firm name, trade name, or other professional de designation if it would violate 7.1. Now, the discussion of 7.1 here confirms that use of firm names, trade names, or other professional designations is considered a communication that's subject to regulation and, and cannot be false or misleading. The, uh, the rule stating that a lawyer cannot state or imply a relationship with a government, with a government agency or a public or charitable legal services organization is really just a carry forward of standard number six and is also consistent with the model rule. Likewise, in 7.5c, the, the fact that a lawyer cannot state or imply a relationship with a law firm or other organization unless uh, such a relationship exists this isn't particularly new. This is consistent with the model rule as a carry forward of the old standard seven and eight. Um, one slight departure from our prior rule and the model rule is that we don't break out a discussion of letterhead. The commission felt that the notion of letterhead is uh, somewhat antiquated in our sort of technological electronic age. Nonetheless, other professional de designation is broadly in in inclusive and includes uh, letterhead along with logos, URLs, meaning web page addresses, and signature blocks, such as electronic signature blocks. So it's fairly uh, broad in terms of what um, that category encompasses. You know, sort of the takeaway of these rules, in my view, is we previously had a compacted discussion of all of what we just discussed in, in 1400. Now we have uh, more of a breakout of these rules in a manner that I think is more organized and structured and easier for lawyers to comprehend. So we, while we might not have a sea change in terms of the rules regulating lawyer communications with the um, public about their services, we have, I think, more effective presentation for lawyers to understand um, the, the rules and prohibitions. So hopefully the, this uh, update to the rules will be helpful guidance for lawyers going forward. So we get to the important part of the uh, rules as far as uh, uh, for the integrity of the profession. These rules were um, scattered in different portions of the rules previously and had been collected together as one uh, in, in one and we're going to focus on three of these rules, 8.4, 8.4.1, 4 and 8.5. Um, 8.4 really is really the category, and it's, an, it's a helpful rule because it defines what constitutes professional misconduct. Um, it used to be a one-sentence rule. Uh, which has been expanded, it used to be rule um, 1.1-120, uh, which simply said that a member shall not knowingly assist in solicit or induce any violation of these rules of the state law. That was it. This rule now expands on that and, ex and uh, helps, uh, makes it, uh, provides some useful definitions of categories. Um, it is more broad, it is broader than the uh, former rules, so that's something to keep in mind, as a lot of these rules have become broader. Um, and the comments of this rule uh, make it clear that a lawyer can violate this rule even when you're not uh, providing legal services or doing anything in a professional capacity. So. Uh, there is a possibility to be disciplined under these rules and under 8.4 for conduct that is not a legal professional conduct. For example, uh, 
there are a lot of ancillary businesses that would, uh, uh, which could potentially come under the ambit of this rule now. Um, the comments also make clear that First Amendment uh, protections are still in place, so <laughs> which is a good thing. And um, as Judge Chu mentioned earlier, and a number of other people have uh, have discussed, uh, this rule, along with the rest of the rules, um, does not prohibit a lawyer from explaining the consequences of violating the rules to their clients. One key difference in subsection A is that not only is a lawyer not allowed to violate the rules by knowingly assisting, soliciting, or inducing another person to do so, but cannot do so through another person. And I think this is an important distinction and an important addition to this rule because it shows up in situations um, where lawyers might work with investigators um, and where the lawyers are, are, should be careful not to um, direct another person, such as an investigator, um, to either violate the rules or even knowingly turn a blind eye to where the investigator or the other person they're working with um, is somehow um, violating the rules. So that is an important difference. That's a new portion of the rules. Um, subsection B um, focuses on criminal acts. That not all criminal acts are going to result in discipline. It's only criminal acts under this, subset, uh, this rule that reflect adversely on the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects. So my parking violation <laughs> does not affect my ability or trustworthiness or fitness. Um, Subsection C is um, focuses on intentional wrongdoing um, to engage in dishonesty, fraud, deceit, recklessness, or intentional misrepresentation. This ties in somewhat to what Justin has just been discussing, the advertising rules. Um, or as Judge Chu started out earlier with the don't lie, cheat, or steal rule. Um, this is another place um, which the, the rules very specifically point out that engaging in this type of mis uh, actions constitutes misconduct. Um, <coughs> subsection D is very broad and it simply says engaging in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. What does that mean? It could mean anything. It could mean a delay in litigation. It could mean um, not withdrawing when your organizational client refuses to do the right thing. It could mean um, oh, I won't go on there in so many examples, but it's a very broad um, category. And it's an important one to keep in mind. Um, but it's a difficult one to pin down. <clears throat> subsection E, another new subsection, um, is says that it's, it is a prohibition to state or imply an ability to influence improperly a government official or agency, and to or that you can achieve results by means that violate the rules the state bar act or other law. Um, you cannot tell people that this is what you can do. I can help you out because I can have this influence. I know these people. I can make these things happen for you because, you know, I can take these actions which um, violate the rules. And finally, subsection F um, prohibits a um, you, from knowingly assisting, soliciting, or inducing a judge or judicial officer in conduct that is a violation of the rules. Um, so this is a good rule to keep in mind 
if there are any doubts as to whether your conduct um, constitutes professional misconduct under the rules and can be disciplined. Um, the rule, the um, uh, comments are useful as well, and I would encourage you to uh, use them as a guide. Um, turning to 8.4.1, this rule uh, This rule has generated a lot of controversy during the uh, uh, process of creating the commission's work. And um, it, I think it's a good rule, uh, the way it is drafted. I think that the Supreme Court has taken a very firm stand against a discrimination, um, harassment, or retaliation in the profession. Um, and very importantly, the court has removed the burden on victims to first prove in a court um, that the discrimination or harassment occurred and is it, that they can hold the, um, um, uh, the lawyers who have done these things civilly liable. So there is no longer the requirement that used to exist in former Rule 2-400 that the victim has to first initiate a civil lawsuit, pursue it, win, let all of the time for appeals lapse, and then, and only then, could the state bar take any action against that lawyer if a complaint were made and the State Bar could use that ruling um, as evidence. This rule gives the State Bar a lot more um, leeway and allows the State Bar to prosecute um, lawyers who uh, violate the rule of harassing, harassment, discrimination, or retaliation um, without the need for a civil action first. And that so just to add on 8.4.1, um, that rule was, I think, by far the most discussed and most controversial rule that was proposed by the Rules Revision Commission. And if my recollection serves me, um, I think it was discussed over five separate sessions uh, of the Rules Revision Commission. And a lot of the controversy, I, I think, for the most part, everybody was in agreement that discrimination is bad. <laughs> retaliation is bad, and lawyers should not discriminate or retaliate. The issue really centered on whether the state bar disciplinary process was the best way or the appropriate way to address it in the first instance. And part of that was reflected by the different standards that are applied in state bar disciplinary proceedings, as well as the limited discovery and the, the different rules of evidence, for example, that apply in those proceedings, and the concern that disciplinary proceedings would then be used as a sword in civil actions, for example, alleging discrimination or retaliation. And, and that, I think, was a big part of the debate over whether the way Rule 2-400 used to deal with it, which kind of gave precedence to any civil action or administrative action, versus giving the state bar disciplinary authorities the potential to be the first out of the gate, so to speak, in addressing this. And uh, you know, I think if you look at comment six, uh, that at least is a recognition that this sort of disciplinary proceeding could be used as a potential sword in civil litigation, for example. And that's why there were portions put in the rules to require that the state bar be informed of these other proceedings that are going on so that in state bar proceedings they can make a decision whether to stay the state bar proceeding, for example, and allow the civil proceeding to take precedence if one is going on over the same conduct. Thank you. Um, that that background is extremely helpful. Um, and to look at the reporting requirements that Judge Chu touched on, subsection E has some mandatory requirements, which requires um, where 
statutes like the UNRWA Act that define these protected characteristics that are protected by California law. Um, so what what this rule does is it applies to both representing clients and the management of law practice. Um, one cannot discriminate in accepting or continuing to accept, uh, represent clients, and one cannot discriminate, harass, or retaliate in the context of managing or running a law practice, uh, either between uh, lawyers or other employees. Um, and this touches on some of the issues that Dina discussed, subsection um, C2 defines what it means to knowingly permit. So you cannot discriminate, harass, or retaliate, and you cannot knowingly permit someone to discriminate, harass, or retaliate. And that touches back to Rule 5.1 and 5.3, which um, you know, which are the people who have the duties, the supervisory lawyers who have the duties to ensure that the rules are being followed um, also have the rule to ensure that there is no um, discrimination, harassment, or retaliation happening in their firm. It is an important distinction to keep in mind. Um, And this is something that Dina touched on as well, is that um, a prohibited act includes a failure to advocate for corrective action. 
the comments make it clear that, that in this rule that the victim does not have to advocate for corrective action. There is no burden on the victim here. The burden is on the lawyers who have the responsibility to take the corrective action that they do so, that they not avoid doing so, and failing to do so is also going to be people subject to this This rule, unlike a lot of other rules, has a lot of comments, and I would encourage you to um, take a look at those closely. Um, the comment two, uh, I will be covered. Um, comment three points out that the conduct prohibited um, includes the conduct of a lawyer before a judicial officer. So this is something for your actions in court. Um, All right, so, um, and comment eight points out, and this goes back to the relationship between a civil action and this disciplinary proceeding, that the rule permits the imposition of discipline for conduct that would not necessarily result in the award of a remedy in a civil or administrative proceeding, if such a proceeding were filed. It's not a defense in, to this to this charge that had a proceeding been filed, there would have been no award to the uh, victim. And so therefore, there should be no discipline. This rule clarifies that that does not work as a defense to this claim. Um, all right, and so I'll turn to rule 8.5, which, um, was the former Rule 1100. Um, and again, this is a very helpful rule because it lays out what the disciplinary authority is of the state bar and what law is going to apply um, under, the, under the state bar proceedings. It, it is somewhat different than the former rule. Um, this makes it clear that there there are no geographic limits um, to the reach of the uh, disciplinary authority of the state law. That it applies to the lawyers admitted in California, regardless of where the lawyer conducts, um, where the lawyer's conduct occurs. And it also applies to lawyers who are out of state, who are not admitted in California, to offer to provide or do provide legal services in California. And um, it also clarifies that a lawyer could be subject to discipline both in California and in another jurisdiction. So this is something to keep in mind that you know, activity in a different state could result in disciplinary conduct. But Subsection B starts. The next slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, hit the wrong button. Thank you. Um, no, one more. Um, sorry about that. Um, but, <laughs> um, Subsection C clarifies which law is going to apply, the choice of law provision. And E1 makes it clear that the conduct in connection with the matter pending before a tribunal, um, the rules of, of the jurisdiction in which that tribunal sits would apply unless the rules of the tribunal provide otherwise. And, and it, it, it occurs to me that this could be a situation where, for example, um, you could have a court, um, you could have a uh, patent, the patent office, for example, um, has its own rules of ethics and some of these to practice in that court. Um, and this rule provides that and, and recognizes that those separate rules of ethics might apply to you if you're practicing before that court. 
um, how the how the conflicts between those will be worked out, we'll see. Um, but I think with these rules, I've brought California closer to the APA rules, and so some of the big conflicts that were there between the APA rules and the California rules uh, are slightly less in the And um, um, finally, Oh, I'm going to do this, this, this computer yeah, in front of me, isn't it? Oh, sorry, I had no idea that that was controlling thing. I'll keep my hands away from it. Um, go back to the next All right. Um, so Oh, okay. All right. So let's let's not worry about the next slide. It's very very basic. Remember, there are no changes to the rules of, uh, to the business and professions code. Those statutes did not change. The rules revisions commissions work was only directed to the rules of professional conduct. The B and people sections are created and controlled and amended by the legislature, and those have all remained in place throughout the presentation today. People talked about the duties um, of lawyers under B and people section six or eight. These are discussed, discussed a lot, which is the duty of confidentiality, and there are a number of other duties that are involved included in that. Uh, rule uh, in the in the BNP six or six eight, and I encourage all of you to take a look at that and refresh your um, recollection of those um, rules. The uh, rules for mo moral turpitude, dishonesty, and corruption um, are also still in place under six or six eight six one o six, and of course. Um, the advertising rules, which are now codified in the, um, the rules for professional conduct that Justin discussed, are also codified at um, the rules of professional conduct 6157 and so on. So um, don't forget those rules. The business professions code does go apply. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just want to briefly mention something about Rule 3.8. I want to allow enough time for questions, so I'm going to kind of go through this rule really quickly. But it's just, um, it was related to the separate path for prosecutors. You might have seen it in your materials. Um, this was deals with the special responsibilities of a prosecutor uh, in Rule 3.8. And this was formerly Rule 5.110, and this kind of had an unusual path to approval. Um, in May 7th of 2017, uh, when, the, when the Supreme Court was provided with all these rules recommendations. Um, oh, I fixed it. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so they denied the approval of subsection B, or excuse me, subsection D of this proposed rule. And, and that basically is a subsection that deals with exculpatory evidence um, and, what, and what is now the attorney's timely duty to disclose uh, information related that tends to negate guilt or to mitigate an offense or a sentence. Um, and so there was further revisions that were made. Um, the Board of Trustees submitted revisions. And then in November of last year, the Supreme Court approved revisions to 5110. So because the new rules weren't in effect at that time, they modified Rule 5110, and that is what is now Rule 3.8. So to keep the numbering consistent, they didn't want to say, we have this new rule, and it's 3.8, and it doesn't fit in numerically with any of the other rules. But um, So the, the rule that's been in effect related to uh, the special responsibility for prosecutors is, is in 3.8, and it's a significant change from the prior rule. I mean, the, the old rule, the original Rule 5110, um, really only had a probable cause element and said that, you know, that um, probable cause must support charges and basically that the prosecutor had a duty to advise uh, there was no longer probable cause. This rule is much more robust um, and has, you know, obligations. It has the probable cause prong. It has um, 
related to reasonable efforts to make sure that this, the accused are advised of their right to choice of counsel and if they have a reasonable opportunity to obtain counsel, this is not just a law enforcement obligation. This is now a matter of professional responsibility. Again, there's a reasonable requirement to it. Um, they are not to seek um, a waiver of an unrepresented person's accused rights. Uh, and then there's the timely disclosure aspect um, in subsection D that I related to that relates to exculpatory evidence, which is really significant. Um, there's also, just to go through these quickly, the reasonable care standard related to making sure that extrajudicial statements of supervised personnel within a prosecutor's office, that they um, uh, make sure that they're, again, this relates to a duty to supervise from this prosecutor that other people in the office aren't making improper extrajudicial statements related to a matter. And uh, there's several sections related to duties regarding wrongful conviction. So there's an acknowledgement that the prosecutor would have duties um, if they became aware of a situation involving a wrongful conviction of, of an individual. So these are significant. There are important changes. They took place last year, but it's important to be aware of them. And for those of you that have contact with the criminal justice system, um, they're, they're extremely important. So. We will. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that yes. this was the one rule that was expedited uh, very early on when the commission got together. We established a procedure for expediting rules that it was deemed we shouldn't wait for all the rules to be adopted. And this was the one and only rule that <laughs> went through the expedited process. And really, the most controversial aspect of the rule was subdivision D regarding timely disclosures of exculpatory information. Um, the rule makes clear that it is not limited to Brady information. That is intended to apply to any potentially exculpatory information. And that actually was deemed to be consistent with California case law establishing that broader obligation. But comment three also makes clear that there may be other laws and other rules that limit that disclosure obligation, notwithstanding this rule. And that's, I think, one of the things when the Supreme Court sent back the original 5-110, most of the revisions were in comment three to make that clear. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any questions? Thank you. In Rule 8.4.1, as I read it, there's a very strange definition of retaliate. Uh, we usually understand retaliate to mean the firm can take adverse action against the victim. Here it seems to say the firm can't take adverse action against the harasser. And am I misreading it? And if not, what was the intention behind that? Um, but I think it's not, uh, it goes to retaliation, for example, for someone who might report a, um, a violation of this rule, um, and that there ought not to be any retaliation against the person who, who reports the um, violation, whether that person is the victim or whether the person is somebody else who had a responsibility. So I think. I'm sure that's not in dispute, but if you take a look at the language, it seems to, it says adverse action against a person who has pursued or participated in the prohibited conduct. And, the uh, but it's the action alleging any conduct prohibited by paragraph A, that's the key, it's any action. So it's the, that or assisted in any action alleging is that. So pursuit uh, is a separate, a separate target. Actually, all I'm saying is that that language turns out to be fairly ambiguous in, in a, and it plays a very important role. Well, I think the intent, at least, was to apply pursued, participated, and assisted to the phrase any action. So it's basically intended to cover anybody who um, you can't retaliate it's against somebody who either brings an action alleging prohibited conduct or assists somebody in doing that. And that, I think, is the intent. So it's not covering, say, an alleged harasser. Thank you. 
And thirdly, someone who participates in the action would be somebody who might say, or be a witness. Needs clarification. <laughs> That's what case law will do. <laughs> reading uh, Rule 7.1 and the comment regarding foreign languages, where it says that uh, a lawyer should not make communication stating that the lawyer is able to provide legal services in a language other than English, uh, and should also identify the employment title of the person who speaks such language. How would that apply in communication from international law firms or firms that cover uh, many, many languages, how would that communication be in compliance with this uh, uh, requirement? Well, I think that the, the rule is, is supposed to be somewhat straightforward in that what it's trying to convey is that when a lawyer who's subject to these rules communicates that, or implies, or states that he or she is able to provide legal services in a language other than English, it has to be clear whether or not it's the, the lawyer himself or herself that has that foreign language ability, or it's someone else uh, that is employed by the firm. So I guess I think you're asking perhaps about that second clause. It's, this is all about being uh, clear and truthful in terms of these types of uh, communications that might influence whether or not a, a consumer or a potential client accepts a, a law firm as, um, and, and part of that is being clear as to who's going to be able to provide that foreign language ability. Is it the lawyer or is it someone else? And if it's someone else, that just has to be made clear. Any other questions? Before we take time to thank our panel for the afternoon presentation, I'd just like to remind and encourage you all to fill out um, the uh, evaluation and feedback form. There's a tray on the table in which you've checked in to collect those forms. And if there are no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our esteemed panel uh, for the afternoon, or the second half of the morning presentation. Thank you. <laughs>